Yes, Your Honor. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Last night, the council filed an SDT with regards to uh, raw data of an MMPI2 that Dr. Torres may be in possession of. It's my understanding that we already dealt with that issue uh, as far as discovery goes. It was real clear, at least my recollection is, that the court said that information could be transferred to experts for evaluation. And so at this time, we're asking that that SDT be quashed. Um, I, don't, I haven't had a chance to talk to Dr. Torres about this, uh, but I'm assuming the state hospital's position has not changed, that they're not going to want to disseminate the raw data from psychological testing. Um, as you know, I, let me see, but I, I don't think I can get it yet. I, I follow the history, and I, and I can tell yeah. from what it is. Okay. Tell me what's going on. Uh, so, Your Honor, I had requested, and, and Dr. Gray provided um, as you remember before, the literature that they were basing some of their diagnoses on, and specifically, the, they had one um, article, and I can file this over, we can supplement it to um, the court. They provided one article specifically dealing with the MMP2, and that certain scores on that, and the article says which ones that you're looking at are some, so some, Generally, disassociative identity disorder is hard to score on the MMP2. Um, this article that was relied upon evidently by Dr. Gray, and he said primarily in this, has certain scores, though, on it that are higher for people that they believe are malingering. And so what all I'm asking, I'm not asking for all of the raw data. I'm asking strictly for the raw data on, on the MMP2, which is basically, it's just a multiple choice questionnaire that people fill out and then it scores a certain way. The reason I am asking for this raw data is just for cross-examination purposes. And so they're saying it scored a separate way. This is not anything that's copyrighted. This is not all of the raw data. This is something very specific in relation to an article that they gave that said her scores don't fit more in what this article says would be malingering. And so what I want just is to have that raw data so I can just go through um, more than likely, and I have a social worker who knows how to, who has some experience in scoring it and so forth, and to look over that exact raw data in an effort for cross-examination. Can you um, point to the part in Dr. Gray's report that you're referring to? I mean, what, 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 what I can, says? Yes, I don't have it um, in front of me, but I can bring that over for the lunch and also the article that he referred to um, on that. And then I, I can give that to the court. And so, like I said, yeah. it's I understand the the general thing with the raw data needs to go between the experts, but this is something that's very specific. And also, this is not something that I think is I don't believe is copyrighted or anything like that. So, like some of the structured sure. interviews, I understand there's some copyright and there's some issues why they don't want the raw data on the structured interviews. This is strictly a multiple choice you get questionnaire. Um, and I, like I said, I'll bring all that for the court to be able to look at. Yeah, if you can do that, because I, I would agree. It sounds like what you're asking for is what what article was it that he was relying upon that said that perhaps the MMPI-2 I, I, may I, not I, I, be applicable, and you want to see that article so that you can... So, let me rephrase. Okay. I have that article. Okay. That article says that certain questions okay. on the MMP-2 if answered in this way, indicate malingering. Other answers on this indicate uh, a more legitimate disassociative identity disorder. And the okay. article actually says what questions, what group of questions okay. they're referring to that indicate this one way or the other. And Dr. Gray said he relied upon that article okay. in scoring the MMP2 to come to his conclusions. And so I'll bring okay. you Dr. Gray's report where he, he says that. Bring me the report and, and the, the and the article. Yep. And then so your honor can see that. Yes, yep. That'll work. Because it's, we're not getting to Dr. Gray today, so. No, but who's next time. week? And I, I put the SDT for Monday. I don't necessarily need it on Monday. I just picked a date sure. that seemed like it would work. Okay. Um, but I'm fine. And we can move that down once the court, court wants to look at it over the weekend and make a decision. Yep. I don't think we're going to get to them even next week. And so if I could, even like if I could have that stuff by Thursday, if the court's That's fine. appropriate, that would be totally fine. Okay. All right. Is there anything else that we need to address? Not by the people there, thanks. Defense? No, sir. Okay, let's go ahead and bring the jury in.
All rise, P3, please. <laughs> Thank you. You may all be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, again, we're going to start the same way that we have uh, every other day, and that is with a question. Has anything occurred since we were last together that causes any of you to believe you could not continue to serve as a fair and impartial juror in this case? If so, please raise your hand. No response. All right, when we took our break on Wednesday, we were uh, towards the end, uh, but still in the midst of a video deposition, and I think that, or not deposition, I'm sorry, a video interview of the defendant, and I think that's where we're going to resume. Is that right? Okay, all right, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry, my bad. There we go. <laughs> yep. Certainly not me. I just accidentally pee a little. Now my pants are wet.
Hey, hey. I think you do the restroom. Okay. We're going to stay in there. The um, hall door is going to be closed where you have your privacy, but we need you not to wipe. Okay. And please don't flush the toilet. Just so that we can verify that indeed you did not wipe, because what we're worried about is potential evidence. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. You can leave your things there, so we'll just come in right back into this room. I'm sorry? I said I acted like I was in like some secure area or something. I guess I'll go to sleep. Can I go to sleep?
Hmm. Thank 
I just need to stretch. Is there anything I can read or do? Oh, that's um, he's waiting for the bomb. Yeah, when she comes home. Well, you think I read? Well, I have to read the book.
Lucy, I'm having a really bad chest pain. Like right here. Okay. My chest is so. Okay, sit down. We'll, we'll call. We'll call for help. Bad chest pain. I need to probably. Okay. Get out of the police van. Just sit in the couch. So you tell me we can't do it. I'm telling you, we're going to call for help right now. But I need you to sit down. I can't breathe. I'm just asking to be out. I can breathe. No. Tight and closed, not claustrophobic. You just need to sit down on the couch. It's really hurting. So. Sit down on the couch. No, I'm, I can't breathe. I'm just asking you to open the door. Five. What if I I just want to breathe. I'm asking you to keep the door open. That's all. No, we're going to no. okay. have to call you an ambulance because you said you're, you got that pain. I just told you, 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 I just I told you earlier, I was claustrophobic and had really bad anxiety, and I take Lazarus for it. Yeah, well, you were claustrophobic until... No, I, excuse me, I take Lazarus every day, and if I don't take it, I can have a panic attack. I take all panic attacks. So you are misquoting what you heard, sir. Okay. Just said open the door. Okay, well, we're going to have medical come check you out. I mean, ridiculous. Yes, I just get since the door's been closed. I haven't taken my anxiety medicine. I've taken it so many days in a row. Okay. I'm having. You had told me um, I don't ever take it except on panic attacks. Yes, but you had told me earlier that you don't take it on a regular basis. I don't. But whenever when I put it for having... few days, I feel like I am. That's why I kept asking you to open the door. So now this gentleman thinks that I'm being frustrating to deal with him when I ask several times just to open the door and let me get fresh air. That's all I ask you several times. Okay. Um, would it be helpful? Like, do you have your lorazepam? No, I don't. Is it in your car? No, I don't. Your house? Or... That's why I asked that I open the door. Like, do you want to see a medical personnel? Or I mean, I just I wanted a door open because I was having chest pain. That's all. So what I what I need what I need very clearly from you right now is for you to tell me whether or not you feel like you are having I a medical like emergency. Any, any now. Okay. Do you feel like you're having a medical emergency that you need to be seen by a medical provider for? I mean, not probably at the moment, but I, I am having chest pains, and usually it's a panic attack alluring. Okay. I mean, I haven't taken it, so it's like taking me off of it because I couldn't get to it yesterday. I do. I've had zero anxiety since I was 16. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. No, so I was literally open yeah, the door and asked him, but I just opened the door at all. And okay. He started making accusations. Okay. Well, I'm sure that wasn't. His intention. Yeah, he wasn't never his intention, but I don't like. I didn't come on interview. Have I? Have I came at you been disrespectful? To you? No, and I hope that you don't feel like I've been disrespectful. No, to you either. Was, that was very unprofessional. What you did? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. I told okay. you we were going to call medical. That, that's, no, that's, that's not what you said. That's not what she okay. said. No, that's so, correct. Then it's on recording. Okay, but that is not what you said. You started okay. making up reasons why when I do have testing. Okay. Well, I believe that you have to think. So, like I said, if you would like medical attention, then we can get you medical attention. Is that what you want? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I told me to get in. And you told me to sit back down and shut the I'll door. I'll sit here with her if you want to. Thank you. Just leave sure the door open. That's all I'm asking. Want the door open. So, we'll get somebody to come check you out. Do you have any kind of, other than the anxiety disorder... Um, do you have any other medical conditions that we should be aware of? No, oh, I'm just hungry and tired, and I okay. when I get like this, I panic attack. Okay. So, I mean, I gave you a hot bucket earlier. Is there something else that I can get for you? Do you want a sandwich? Do you want a burrito? I have molly. We have all kinds of stuff here. We can order something if there's, if there's something that you need to eat. You just got to tell me what it is. What would you like? I mean, obviously, I'm not going to buy lobster, you know, but what would you like to eat? Uh, first, I would like to 
you, they can they can they like help me with anxiety medicine? You need somebody to bring it as your anxiety medicine. Like I have an anxiety medicine here. So. Yeah, I'm saying you said you could call medical professionals. Sure, I can call like um, an EMT. Like they're gonna they're gonna call an EMT, but they're not gonna be able to dispense medication to you if you have a prescription. I mean, maybe your husband can bring it. We can get you your medication. You can self administer what you already have prescribed to you. Sorry, I'm just right here. Huh? Well, my throat is blowing now. When all I asked was for the door to be opened. Okay, well, it's open. I know, but he, he was very, like, rude about it. So can I please read? That's all. Okay. Well, maybe you two don't click. You know, no, you sometimes just, it happens. But, come on. I'm a human being. It's the door. Clearly, I'm not going anywhere. The door. Fine, open the door. That's all I ask. Well, let's open now. So we yes, I appreciate stuff. you. Thanks. Mm. You know, if there's anybody at your house that can bring your medication? Oh, mm, sorry. My medication is not at my house. Probably. What did I? Yeah, book bag. So yeah, it's probably in my book bag. Let's put it my friends and wait here. But I don't have a number because you guys took my phone. So. Well, if you want to tell us your passcode, we can get the number out of the phone. If that's you guys it. already had the passcode because I told you plainly earlier when you were here about something. I said the code for I think it's the same password we use for everything. Oh. I, I don't know what that passcode is. If you want me to get your friend's phone number out of your phone, if you want to give me the passcode, then I can use it. Okay, but you said medical. By the time my friend would get here, the medical people could already. But they're not going to be able to dispense medication. Like, the EMT is not going to be able to dispense medication. So, I have a test page that you're just telling me I can't, I can't do nothing. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying they're calling for medical personnel. Oh but it's going to be an EMT. You're telling me your chest pains are anxiety related and I'm trying to offer a right. solution to get your prescribed medication for that issue. It's because I haven't taken it. So you know. Do you have any, like, you know, some people, whenever they have anxiety attacks and stuff like that, they have, like, little, like, songs that they sing to themselves or things that they think about that kind of help calm their, calm their mind, calm their anxiety. Do you have anything like that? Maybe, like, a favorite vacation that you've been on? What's your favorite? What's your favorite vacation you've ever been? Mm -hmm. I'm Aruba. What did you do while you were in Aruba? All right, gotta breathe. Titan, like right here, you know. Thanks, President. Oh, not kind of spreading right here. Are they almost here? I've been standing here with you, so I don't, I don't have that answer.
What was the last time you took your lorazepam? Uh, okay. I'm saying like you take that like that policy in the mouth. You can't just not take it the next day. You have to like. Right. So I'm asking, when was the last time you took it? So I was taking it yesterday. What's, what's today? I don't know. Today. Today it's is the day of the week. Wednesday. Yeah. So I didn't take it Tuesday. Or a. You said your favorite vacation was Aruba. Mm -hmm. Do you like to like scuba dive or snorkel or? I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. I'm getting dizzy now. Okay. We'll just lean back on the couch. Yeah, like loading activity. Loading activity? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yep. Feel free to put your feet up. What you need to do. I don't care about y'all taking one day. What's your question? Wiping my thing because of evidence. So, don't think because I know that's what I do. He knows it. And said, if you're going to take it anyway and you can have it, that's important. But I really have a chest pain. Believe you. So, my body is not everyday condition and I work out a lot. and I took a Tylenol, that's why I spoke up earlier. I took a Tylenol? Mm -hmm. I got started getting like a headache and I a little bit of pain, but sometimes that helps you. Sure. Maybe I'll go with Sandra. Like if I had like something in the ass and could I get something to read, that might be help. And she's talking about focusing on the brain or something. I feel like that would help, you know? But he said I couldn't have anything to read. So. Remember how we talked about other questions? Help the find path? You can hear them in. I can't really do. Okay. But I will be in for you. Mm -hmm. Are you okay listening to me? Is that okay? What's your name? That's right, right, right. Well, you can you can take your time to answer. I want to answer you right away, so then that would trigger that. So just it's gonna take a little bit, just like three minutes or so. That's good. <clears throat> It's hard to breathe in here. Why does it sound like hard to breathe? They get stuffy after a little bit. They do. They do. Yeah, I mean, we got one. Yeah. Um, you know. Where did we get those shoes? Oh, your old shoes. I've seen pattern before. Yeah, your old shoes. 
Um, I'm a Nike free guy like that. Well, not that same pattern. Maybe the sole in that. No. If it's a five pointer, a different five pointer than if it's if it's the same one. I don't remember really where these are. They're probably like a 2012 model. Maybe 14. They might not. Yeah, I've had my Nikes forever. They last for a while. Oh. Are they coming? I need to get some oxygen. I don't know if it's coming. But sometimes if you... I did, I couldn't breathe. You can't breathe. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a bit of anxiety? Is that right? Well, I guess it was done by diet changes and like workout changes, and I can't breathe. So I asked that guy to open the door and tell me no, and shut it, and like leave. Mm. That light blink Yeah, it blinks. There. Here we are. That's all clear. Thank you. Are you sure? Yeah. Fire department. Fire department. What's going on? I just, I have a little bit of sustain. Yeah, just like right here. And now I can't breathe. I just tried to get them to open the door so I could breathe, but. Okay. It wasn't. What did you just what? I'm sorry. I didn't have, like, I took a resume. I don't know if they're, they might be anxiety, anxiety related, but. Okay. I don't want to just check it. Oh, I had anxiety since I was like. Mm. I was like, mm. Okay. Did you just take the more as um as meeting? Yeah. Okay. But I had took it, taken it like a few days in a row, so okay. without taking it so I can do that. You can lay back if you're more comfortable. Okay. You okay. so have chest pain right now? Yep. What does it feel like? Oh, no, right now it's going up more and more. What does it feel like? Is it a stabbing pain? Is it a pressure? No, it's like pressure. Pressure. Okay. Are you nauseated? Yep. Have normally short of breath? Well, I could breathe in here and I kept asking them to they open the door so I could breathe. Okay. We're just going to check your heart. Put some stickers on you and take a picture of the electrical activity of your heart there. Any other medical problems other than uh, anxiety? Any other ones? I mean, like dealing with that area or in general? In general? Do you have any other medical problems like yeah, and, diabetes? Yeah, like pressure? yeah, like asthma. Uh, asthma, but not uh, those older ones that you should. Do you have any other diagnosed medical history from a doctor? No diagnosed, no. Okay. Do you take any medication any, every day other than the low asthma we already talked about? Not every day, no. What other medicines do you take today? I don't know what it's called. What is it for? Mm -hmm. okay. Do you have any allergies to medication? Mm -hmm. What's the birthday? Mm -hmm. yeah, How old are you? Mm -hmm. How old are you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, 35. No. Mm -hmm. And what's your date of birth? Mm -hmm. What's that? 35. Now, what's your date of birth? What day were you born? In what year? Okay, okay, I'm not going to look at the test. 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 I'm not going to well, we're going to have to put some stickers right underneath your left breast here so we can take a look at the heart. Sir, what year? Oh. 1993. 1983. Ma'am, I didn't catch your name. Can you give me your name, please? Not teacher. Can you spell teacher, please? Can you spell teacher, please? Can you spell teacher, please?
Then when's the last time you had problems with your anxiety? Mm -hmm. I have it every once in a while, like, whenever I don't eat and don't, you know, like, exercise and different routines. Huh? Any drugs or alcohol today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where have you spoken? I said. Are you before we see I'm asking if you drugs or alcohol. Yeah, like turn it off. You get really dizzy. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Your vital signs look good. I'm going to take a look at your heart here, okay? Okay. <laughs> Can you up like a breeze? Okay, sit up. Sure, I'm so comfortable. Do you want to turn your legs over here so you can sit down and lean against the back of the castle? Okay. Okay. Doctor? Yeah, I'm going to be. Yep, you're uh, on on that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um. I'm going down to my stomach. I'm right here. Okay. Oh. Really You're getting an, enough oxygen. Yeah. I know. I can't really breathe. I just want like you got is it like some oxygen air? Sure, sure. Or? That's what I'm saying. You get, you're getting enough oxygen right now. You're just you need to control your breathing. Okay. I'm trying. Control your breathing now, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. you know with anxiety, if you start over breathing, then you're getting that can develop that chest pain. Right. Let's one on. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I hope that's gonna work. Turn, turn, turn on. 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 Turn yeah, I got me. Here you go. Well, I, I, I'm sending it right now. Ma'am, would you like to go to the hospital? Yeah. Your heart looks good, everything looks normal. Yes, I want to go. which hospital would you like to go to? Yeah, I don't even know where I'm at. Okay, so you're going to have some memorials to close this. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. I call these pickers. We're gonna have to do it when we get down to the. I'm getting cold. Okay, the anti therapy part, they're gonna get. Then go ahead and hold on to the bag here. We're just gonna figure out what we're going on here. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and I'm going to walk out here to the, 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 the
Okay, right off of. Okay, just kind of on that top there. Okay. Oxygen saturation are 100%. Oxygen saturation are 100%. Go ahead. If you're having an anxiety issue, I think when you have anxiety issues or a common symptom is feeling like you can't breathe, although you're doing kind of you can just flow into your nose out through your mouth and then we'll take deep breaths out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so just take deep breaths into your nose and after. Thank you. We got it. We got it. Prosecution. We just would bring uh, Jess Bethel, Jessica Bethel back to the stand, Judge. Ms. Bethel, if you would resume your seat in the witness stand, I remind you, ma'am, that you're still under oath. Good morning, Ms. Bethel. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm well, thank you. Good. <clears throat> um, you told us on uh, Wednesday when you were here how many homicide investigations you were involved with. Can you remind us again how many that is? Over 100. Is it fairly common in your experience that when people are at the um, sheriff's office on a murder investigation and detained that they can get very nervous? Yes. Is that what was apparent uh, with the defendant there at the end of that video? Yes. Overruled, I think she can offer an opinion regarding uh, her experience uh, based on other, uh, the responses of other um, people that she's been in contact with. So go ahead and answer that. Yes. <clears throat> Early in the, uh, I guess I shouldn't say early uh, in the interview, but at some point in the interview, <clears throat> um, it appeared that the defendant was trying to leave the interview room and then a separate person comes in and has her phone. Do you remember that portion? Yes. Um, who was that other person, first of all? That was Lieutenant Mitchell Mahalko. Is he with the sheriff's office also? Yes, he is. Um, was it uh, very apparent by her actions at that particular time that she wanted to leave and wanted to take her phone with her. Yes. Um, when she showed up at the sheriff's office, do you know how she got there that day? She drove herself in her Tiguan. And is that when um, we had testimony from another detective? Is that when it was uh, observed that it had appears to have just been recently washed prior to driving down to the sheriff's office? Yes, that's correct. Uh, we see the, um, medical folks come in, the ambulance folks. Where did they take um, the defendant after leaving the video there? They took her to Memorial Hospital on Boulder. Is this, and we've already had testimony from uh, forensic nurse examiner Amanda Van Nest. Uh, is that interaction with uh, the FNE, the nurse, does that occur as soon as she gets to the hospital when she leaves the sheriff's office here? That interaction did not occur immediately when she got to the hospital, no. I mean, the same day? Yes. That's what I mean. I, I shouldn't have said the word immediately. But she goes from the sheriff's office by ambulance directly to the hospital, and then at the hospital is where she interacts. Sustained. Rephrase. Sure. Does she leave directly from the sheriff's office in an ambulance? Yes, she did. Did the ambulance drive her directly to Memorial Hospital? Yes. 
at Memorial Hospital is that when she had contact, she being the defendant, had contact with forensic nurse examiner Amanda Van Nest. Yes, that's correct. Um, at that hospital, um, after being there for some period of time, is did the defendant walk away from the hospital before completing uh, a same exam? Yes, she did. So did this um, purported anxiety attack um, achieve her goal of wanting to leave the sheriff's office? Ultimately, yes. Would committing a murder and being detained in the sheriff's office cause somebody to have nervousness and potentially have a panic attack? Object to relevance. Sustained. So I want to jump ahead in time. After um, the defendant left the hospital on January 29th, were you aware of where she was? Uh, throughout the investigation, I was aware at certain times, yes. Okay. Were you aware of when um, she actually moved things out of her house on 6627 Mandan Drive? Yes. What day was that? The 31st of January. So two days after your interaction with her at the sheriff's office? Yes. In between those two events, did you have any other personal contact with her face-to-face? -face? I did not. Did you attempt to have any personal contact with her face-to-face? -face? I did not. Once um, that occurred at the house on January 31st where she moved things out, um, are you aware that she had a TV interview with Spencer Wilson from KKTV? Yes, I observed that. Um, in that interview, and we've had testimony from Spencer Wilson earlier, um, she complained that in her interaction at the sheriff's office, she was not allowed to eat or drink or take bathroom breaks. Was she allowed to do those things at the sheriff's office? Yes, she was offered those things. In the in that interview that we just watched uh, over the later in the day on Wednesday and then this morning, um, at some point the defendant made a reference to you about, "Well, you've been in my house. You know what it's like there." Uh, when did you actually ever go to the house? I went to the house. I believe it was in February. February twenty first. Sound right? That does sound correct. Is it typical that a that the lead detective potentially wouldn't have to go to um, scene like that um, at least early on? Yes, they would go typically early on. What about the idea that um, at the beginning it's reported as a runway and you don't know necessarily that where a scene might be that you need to look at? Does that play into the fact that you don't go as early? Yes. This is leading. No, it does not suggest the answer overruled. Go ahead. Yes. Do you remember um, getting text messages from the defendant um, into February of 2020? I know there were several times that she sent me text messages. I can't recall all of the dates specifically. Sure. But were you getting text messages from her? Um, after she left the house on January 31st? Yes. Did you become aware of the defendant attempting to get her passport and bag back from evidence? Yes. Do you remember when that occurred? I believe that was also on the 31st. Okay. Did you get a text message specifically about that? those things, needing to get her passport and bag back? I do recall um, asking about a passport. Do you remember when that was? I don't recall the date, no. If I showed you your report, would that refresh your memory? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach the witness with uh, her report, which is pagination 010980? You may. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, 
take a look at this report and it up when you're done. With it. Do you remember that text message? Yes, I do. Um, what was, first of all, let, let me ask you this. Was there anything odd about that text message? Was it coming from, strike that, was it coming from <laughs> a, a phone number that you recognized? No, it was not. Um, did you, based on context, were you able to determine who it was coming from? Yes. What was that context that gave you that information? Um, the person texting said that they did not do anything to Gannon and that there was no negligence on their part. Okay. And so that led you to believe that it was coming from who? Leticia. I'm going to retrieve that report from you. At some point, um, was a decision made to travel to South Carolina? Yes. When was that made? Early March. Why was that decision made? Um, Leticia had fled to South Carolina, and by that time I had obtained probable cause and uh, authored a, an arrest warrant for her, which was signed off by a judge at the El Paso County Courthouse. And so we went to... Uh, Myrtle Beach to arrest her. When you say we, can you tell us who all was involved in that process? It was members from the local FBI, Detective Mark Riley and myself, and also local law enforcement and members of the FBI in Myrtle Beach. Was that a arrest actually affected in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina? Yes. Was the defendant um, interviewed in South Carolina? Yes, she was. Do you remember by who? Grusom. Uh, who is John Grusing and who is he with? He is with the FBI. Okay. And we're going to hear from him at a later time, so I'm not going to get into her interview with you. Um, was there some discussion had as to um, how the defendant would get from South Carolina back to Colorado? Yes. What was the ultimate decision made as to that transportation? Uh, that she would be driven back to Colorado uh, in a rental van. Who was involved in driving her back? Myself and Detective Riley, and later on, Deputy Michaela James. So, um, did you actually stop somewhere in the middle of that uh, drive from South Carolina to Colorado to pick up the other deputy that you just mentioned? Yes, we did. <clears throat> um, how long did that drive last? More than 24 hours. Were you with the defendant the entire time? Yes. What was her demeanor like during that transportation? She was calm. She ate, um, she sang songs, she played trivia. Were, was she able to um, have conversations? Yes. Conversations um, that were not related to the investigation? Yes. Were they appropriate conversations, meaning um, if she's saying things, did they make sense? Yes. Was she able to eat and drink? Yes. Was she able to use the restroom? Yes, she was. And you mentioned um, trivia and singing songs. Was that something that all of you were sort of doing in the vehicle? Yes, just to pass the time. And was she participating in that um, in an appropriate way, meaning uh, nothing seemed out of the ordinary? That's correct, yes. The entirety of that um, transport from South Carolina to Colorado, was that audio and video recorded? Yes. Um, thankfully, we're not going to play all of those hours of video, okay? Correct. Um, but why was that audio and video recorded? Um, I was concerned with her previous behavior that uh, she may do something, and so I wanted to have documentation of the transport. Okay. So I want to bring up to you People's Exhibit 338. Please take a look at that. 
and let me know if you recognize it. Yes, I do. Uh, how do you recognize it, first off? Uh, my initials and date are on it, and it is a GoPro video of the extradition. Um, it's a, can you say that it, it's a what video? GoPro. Oh. Um, is it a, only a portion of that hours long uh, transportation from South Carolina to Colorado? Yes, just a very small portion. Have you had a chance to review that um, thumb drive containing that GoPro video? Yes, I have. Is it fair and accurate representation as to the contents in um, that portion of the transportation? It is. And does that uh, thumb drive actually contain two different clips, so two different files on the thumb drive? It does, yes. Is it a fair and accurate representation of uh, that transportation portion? Yes. At this time, I'd move for uh, admission of People's 338. Uh, Mr. Cook? Your Honor, Mr. Allen and I speak very quickly. All right. All right, Exhibit 338 will be admitted. Go ahead. Permission to publish, Your Honor. You may. Go ahead. Well, actually, before I get into to publishing that, um, so what are we about to see in, in People's Exhibit 338, just to give some con context? The first clip is a, um, a view of Letitia, along with Deputy James, in the back seat of the van. They're sitting in captain's seats. And uh, during that portion of the video, you can see Letitia moving around slightly. And that's because her hands are um, handcuffed to a belly band around her waist. And she is manipulating her hands out of the handcuffs. And she obtains a monster energy can. And she strikes Deputy James in the face with that full unopened can of monster energy drink and then struggles with deputy james um, i myself have noted several pre-contact cues where she is glancing at deputy james waist area where her gun was kept and then ultimately whenever i come back to assist deputy james once the vehicle is stopped she also glances at my waist where my gun is kept um, i took that to be a threat that she was attempting to obtain one of our weapons. Um, so let's have some context. Where did this occur in that travel from South Carolina to Colorado? This is on Can in Kansas on Interstate 70. What approximate speed were you all traveling when this occurred? About 75 miles an hour. What was the reaction to this um, action by the defendant to who was driving? Uh, Deputy Riley was. What was his reaction to that happening in the backseat of the van? Um, we immediately start giving commands to Letitia to stop. And as we're doing that, Deputy Riley pulled over to the shoulder of the interstate. Um, thankfully, there was an area clear for us to pull over, and he slammed on the brakes, which put her into the back seat of my seat. Uh, was that a highly dangerous uh, situation that was unfolding? Absolutely, yes. What made it highly dangerous? Um, Ms. Stout was already suspected of murder, and she assaulted a, a deputy who was armed and attempted to obtain her firearm. Uh, what about the fact that you're on the highway and, and that action or reaction by <laughs> Detective Riley had to occur? What, did that also enhance the dangerousness of it? 
Yes, he wasn't able to exit the vehicle to immediately help us because of traffic that was traveling so quickly next to us. All right, let's go ahead and play that. And I believe it's 21 minutes. Would you like me to stay up for this? Uh, is it I'm, I'm, yeah, it's roughly that. Okay, you can go ahead and step down. Thank you. You ready? She keeps on threatening me. She keeps on threatening me. I have stopped it. She keeps on. She got out of her streets. She keeps on. Threatening me. I will for you. She keeps threatening me. Put your arm down. Put your arm down. She's threatening me the whole time. She should give me your arm. I will to you. She should give me. She should give me your arm. I will to you, but not to her. with me. Cooperate with me. I will with you, but not with her. Cooperate with me. I will with you, not with her. I will with you, not with her. Tisha? Mm -hmm. I will with you, I said. I will with you. Give me your own now! I said I would with you. I said I would with you. I said I wouldn't with you. Stop resisting. I'm not resisting. I said I would with her. Go ahead. I got it on. I have to stop. You should stop I'm not resisting. resisting. Yes, you are. Stop it. Put it behind your back. Yep. Please just stop it. I'm not even doing anything. You just got another charge. Well, she shouldn't be doing me like this. Stop trying to turn. I'm not trying to turn. She can stay that way the rest of the trip. Please don't want to. You want to the nearest detention facility? No. Oh. Oh, could you could you please untighten it from my hands? Not right now, Keisha. Yes, it's all my it's all my arms. Lean forward. We forward so I can adjust it. Stop manipulating the cloth. Manipulating you.
You good? You make call yet? No, I don't know where we're at. Okay, hang on. Lock the doors. I got her slot. Can you turn the air on? My well, I asked for help for the air, and she's been nothing but mean to me the whole day. I can't breathe. Stop. I can't breathe. Put it open so I can breathe. That's all I'm asking for is to breathe. Just to... I'm just asking to breathe. That's it. It's to breathe. That's all I want to do is breathe. 2600 Avenue. Right no, by pretty, pretty Horses. On 70. I'm not resisting her. It's, you're hurting my arm. My phone is jacking up. Cold. You're hurting my arm. You're hurting my arm. Just I just stop. want my arm. It's hurting my arm. Just let my arm up. It's hurting my arm. The more you press against me, the harder I'm going to press on the... the I just, it's not the pressure point. It's my arm. It's okay. bent backwards and it's hurting. Can you just take yes, a the arm? Detective Bethel with the Opasa County Sheriff's Office. Please, off my arm. I am not to your name. I am not. To the 2600 block it's, of it's pulling my Interstate it's 70. It's pulling my wrist, please. Can you listen I have Heathrow yes. Belch in custody. Listen he's just attempted to escape. And she's trying to resist yeah. I didn't try to Hold escape. On. You did try. No, I didn't open the door. Debris. Yes, ma'am. I'm on I-70 westbound yes. in the 2600 well, block. We were calm. We were not doing anything, correct? Can you please but as with my my my, my, my reasons, let, me, ask, let me speak first, okay? Okay. As soon as you try to open that door. You remember the last mile marker we hit? The door so I could breathe. It's hot. I asked you to help me, but you just lean over and don't help. I said, hey, could you please find out how to turn the air on? Hey, the whole time you've been nothing but rude to me. Tisha. I'm just putting my arm down because it's hurting. I didn't try to escape or anything. I legit opened up the door to breathe. Detective Jessica Bethel with the Impossible County Sheriff's Office. Oh, my arm is hurting. I am in a gray Chrysler minivan bearing Michigan plates. We have the hazard zone and we're on the shoulder of the road. Tell him to pick it up. We need a code three response, please. You said you would help my arm. I pressure. Nope. He's assaulted. Oh, it's hurting. Boy, Edward Tom Henry at working again. Hurting my arm. It's hurting. Eight uh, four of eighty three is her birthday. I did not try to escape. No man, I have two other deputies with me. Yeah. SRT. Could not breathe. I actually opened it over. Yep. We've got her under yes, control right now. We've got um uh, Kansas coming out here now. Well, we're gonna get some some yes, other man. equipment to at least secure her. Or no, at least don't. have them, somebody take us or escort us to the border and then have one of our people come to the border. We're hurting my arm. Okay. Yeah, everything. Everybody's fine. You're good. You hit her. With a fist. She got out of her cuffs. She slipped her cuffs and she hit slipped them. Uh, a deputy and tried to escape. I did not try to escape. So that's what our plan is. So if you can, I don't know how far we are. No, nope. no, okay. As soon as we get an escort to the, we just need a, a secure unit to transport further. Yep. 
We're going to have, is that for state patrol, we'll have them escort us to the Colorado border. Do you have any yeah. state patrol? Well, my arm is hurting. Or who's dispatching out, man? Where you going to go? Where are you trying to go? Okay. okay. No, I just want to get off my arm. It's hurting. Okay. I understand. So if I feel okay. like you're right. trying to pull against me, yeah. if I could get a state patrol right. officer in route as well to help me uh, escort to the, the uh, oh. Colorado border. Lift my head off. You know, like, we're going to use your time to understand and we'll see what we can do. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to put my partner, Detective Riley, on the phone with you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. We're at 284. Okay. Can you please lift up on this? No. Not up for that. After what? Once you're yes, ma'am. Um, we're we're doing an expedition. I didn't try to Pieces escape. Back. I opened a door to breathe. Uh, back you know to Colorado. Uh, yes, I did. Cuffs and you assaulted know. a deputy. We have her under control right now. Um, but we would appreciate it. It's like it's breaking my wrist. I think we don't have much state patrol in here, so if that's possible. Relax. I can't. Or the pressure will get worse. But if it gets worse, then guess what? I have to go to a hospital because she hurts me. What's your number, Jess? Uh, on this that, 650-719. should just be able to look it up. That's correct. We're at the 284? 284, westbound. My wrist is hurting. hurting. Relax. I can't. Yeah, my wrist is breaking. Your wrist is not breaking. It is breaking. hurting. The more you wiggle, the more it's going to Thank you. Relax. Talk I'm trying, you. but it's hurting. Like, things are hurting my Stop wrist. moving. No, that's fine. We'll we'll wait here for for officers. You're pushing down on me. Thank you, ma'am. We've got some mm, bye -bye. right now. They're coming right now. We've got six in route. Stop trying. I'm to not trying to resist. And stop I'm turning. To you, you're holding me for nothing. Okay, stop trying to turn against me. I'm not going to turn against you. You're holding me. Go ahead and buckle her. We're going to make sure she's not going to get out of her restraints this time. I'm going to see if they have a belly belt, a real one. I'm pretty Marius. This isn't going to happen again. Pretty Marius. I'm not doing anything. She's doing that. I'm not doing anything. I'm not turning against you. I'm not turning against you. You're doing that to me on purpose. See? Look what she's doing on purpose. Look. Stop turning. I'm not turning. I'm not moving. Relax your body. My body's relaxed. Stop. I'm not doing anything to you. You're trying to choke me now. Okay, you want to bring her out. She's out of her cuffs right now. No, we got her back in. Got her back in. But they're the vehicle they're slapped on. Hurting. I mean, they're not they're not good. We'll bring her out. We'll lock double yeah. lock them. Pull them out. Bring her out. Just fine. Step out, Fisha. Oh, she choked me. Now it hurts. <laughs> Yeah, reach, reach to her. You're not gonna get too far. You don't get a dog. You understand? I'm not. I'm not doing anything. I didn't try. You better run faster. Well, I didn't try to run away. I opened the door so I could breathe. Do you guys have a? a 
Where are you going? Colorado. Oh, Lord, you got a wet. That's okay. Yeah. And we have a what? Do you have a better belly belt than this? Oh. It's you're better. I don't have a friend. Uh, I don't. Let's do this. Let's let's go out here in the ditch. Let's get her down on her knee. That's what I mean. No, they they has three of them transport one person. Yes, they do. So, they were all people that died to living inside the firm and not on the so if we could just have uh, Miss Bethel come back to the stand, or do you want to take a break? I I was going to uh, request you take a break now. Yeah, that's is, that, is this a good breaking yeah, point? Okay. okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, we will take our morning break. If I can have everyone back in the jury room at say uh, ten forty-five, we should be able to start on time at that point. Uh, again, don't discuss the case among yourselves. Don't discuss the case with anyone else. Don't do your own independent research about any aspect of this case. With that, all rise for the jury, please. <laughs> Thank you. May all be seated. Record should reflect the jury has left the courtroom. Um, are we still going to finish the rest of that video, or is it... no? I don't think there's anything more on okay. of her on there. And then right. I'm just going to jump into finishing up with questions. Okay. All right. Just just asking. All right. All right. Court will be in recess. Thank you. All right.
Thank you. Court will recall 20 CR 1358 People versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury is not present in the courtroom. Is there anything we need to take up outside the presence of the jury at this point in time? Prosecution? No, you are. Defense? No, sir. All right. Um, and Ms. Bethel, if you would resume your... I assume that's what you were doing, right? Absolutely, Judge. Ms. Bethel, if you would resume your seat in the witness stand, I remind you, ma'am, that you're still under oath. Good anticipation. You must have done this a couple times yourself, Judge. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and bring the jury in. <laughs> All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. May all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358 People versus Letitia Stalk. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Uh, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Your Honor. Miss <clears throat> uh, Bethel, in that um, video that we just watched, um, there's references made by you and I think maybe uh, Detective Riley about escape, and then we can hear the defendant say, I'm not trying to escape. What was she doing that was leading you to believe that she was trying to escape? Uh, the fact that she had slipped her handcuffs, assaulted a deputy. Then later, um, she opened the back door of the van, which is why I returned to that position. Um, led me to believe that she was trying to escape. How did she open the door? With her foot. So when, when in that second clip that we watched, uh, when you end up back in the back seat again, um, is that what you're talking about? Yes. You can't really see that necessarily on the video, though. No, you cannot. <laughs> um, there's comments made in that video about um, stop resisting and that sort of thing, um, but maybe can't s see what those resisting efforts might have been on the part of the defendant. So can you describe that for the jury, please? She was tensing her body, and she was also using her hands to try and manipulate around in the cuffs. I was afraid she was going to slip out of the handcuffs again. Um, in that second clip of the video, um, are you actually holding her feet down? I had placed my knee onto her thigh area to hold her leg down. Okay. Were you actually injured um, during that interaction? Uh, later on, yes. Okay. What happened to you as a result of that? Um, we placed her in a uh, mechanical advantage control hold or a mock hold. Myself and another deputy to escort her to a patrol car. And when we did, she dropped all of her weight and I was uh, carrying her, or escorting her with my left arm. She dropped all of her weight, which caused me to have a shoulder injury, which needed surgical repair. Was that um, another effort to resist or um, potentially uh, cause you to exert law enforcement authority with her? Yes, we'd call that passive resistance. <laughs> I want, to, I want to go big picture with you for just a moment, um, Ms. Bethel. <clears throat> there were a number of searches of the home, 6627 Mandan Drive. Why were there so many um, subsequent searches that build on each other over time in this particular case? 
Initially, uh, we did not, as I said earlier, we did not have a scene per se where there was a body and evidence lying around for us to look at and, and evaluate. And the information that we learned was during the course of the investigation, uh, Leticia was the person that could provide us with that information, yet she had given us several different stories. And so as the investigation uh, proceeded, we learned new things, which made us have to go back in and then look for these new developments in the home. So the fact that the investigation um, developed the way it did, was that driven largely by the defendant's own deliberate actions? Yes. Did she mislead the investigation? Yes, she did. Did that uh, misleading the investigation um, start at the very beginning of the case? Yes. Did it continue until her arrest? Yes. Um, the fact that um, Gannon's remains were found 1,300 miles away, is that part of that um, misleading the investigation? Yes, it is. <clears throat> Um, are you aware of uh, whether a sharp object was ever located in um, the home that was used to cause those sharp force injuries that Gannon suffered? No, I'm not. Um, there were reports that we've heard from already from the medical examiner and um, people in Florida that there were three gunshots um, carried out, um, two that hit a pillow and one that hit Gannon. Were there any shell casings ever found um, during the course of this investigation? No. Were there any um, of Letitia's clothes, the defendant's clothes, that had the defendant, I'm sorry, Gannon's um, blood on them? Yes. What were those? Her shoes. Okay, but what about her clothing? No. Does the fact that those things were missing, a sharp force instrument, the shell casings, and uh, bloody clothing, um, did that complicate the investigation? Yes. You mentioned earlier um, that the drive from South Carolina to Colorado was many hours long, um, but you also had contact with her prior to that as well. During the totality of your contact with the defendant, did she ever talk with a Spanish accent? No, she did not. Did she ever appear to be in a different personality than what she had been in in any other time that you had contact with her? No. <clears throat> Was her, was her personality and persona consistent throughout your time with her? Yes, it was. Were you able to develop, based on your interactions with her, uh, an opinion as to her sanity during the time that you were with her and during the course of this investigation? There are objections on the All right, overruled. Were you able to develop an opinion as to her sanity? Yes. And what is that opinion? I believe she is sane and she is manipulative and very calculated okay thank you that's all i have cross-examination mr cook <clears throat> thank you miss bethel good morning good morning my name is will cook i represent miss stout um i know you're familiar with so <clears throat> your first contact with her was with Gannon's father and it was at a Starbucks in Felton. That's correct. Okay. And we listened to that recording. Yes. Okay. Uh, and you testified that she seemed to be um, apprehensive. That was that interview. That was during the phone call okay. leading up to the ultimate uh, in person meeting with her and Albert. Yes. Okay. And why do you say apprehensive in the phone call? Uh, when I contacted Leticia, I explained who I was and that I was assigned to the investigations division. And Leticia said, I have already spoken with eight other people. And I asked her if I could meet her at the home. And she did not want me present in her home, stating that there were several young children in the home and she did not want them to overhear our conversation. And that later turned out to not be correct. Okay. Uh, now, in the video interview at the sheriff's headquarters downtown, was that the office just right across the street from the courthouse? 
Yes, sir, it okay. is. And it, it seems at times that she's very cooperative. Like she won't talk, stop talking. She just keeps going on and on and on. And she seems very personable. Is that your recollection of what was going on in the video? In terms of her willingness to have a conversation, yes, she was willing to have a conversation. Okay. So she didn't seem apprehensive at that point as far as talking and, and, and meeting with investigators. I wouldn't say that to be completely correct. Okay. So in this, the at least the couple, first couple of hours, you say that she was still apprehensive? In certain uh, areas, yes. Okay. Did during this interview uh, at Starbucks or at the interview room at the El Paso County Sheriff's Office, did she ever try to physically assault you or the, any of the other deputies? No, she did not. Okay. And in one of the interviews uh, at Starbucks, speaking with Gannon's father, do you remember when he said um, that they had put Gannon into counseling because of custody issues? Yes. Okay. Did Gannon's father ever mention that Gannon was put into custody or uh, put into counseling because of issues between Leticia and Gannon? No. How long would you say you were in uh, the car or the van total with Miss Stouck from South Carolina back to El Paso County? Oh, well, we'd never made it back to El Paso County. Well, yeah, but to wh where it stopped, I'm sorry. Over 24 hours. 24 20, hours. I would say close to 24 hours at least. Now, did y'all stop in a hotel at one point or were y'all just switching off drivers and doing it straight? We were just switching off drivers. Okay. Was this some sort of police van? Was it marked or was it just a white cargo van that you rented somewhere? It wasn't a cargo van. It was a uh, commercial. It was a passenger van that the sheriff's office had rented for us okay <clears throat> what was miss stouch's demeanor during other than the video that we were watching what was her demeanor for the other 23 and a half hours or 24 hours you were in the van with her she was calm Calm. And you said y'all were doing trivia, singing, that sort of thing? Yes. Okay. Where was everybody seated in the van when uh, she slipped the cuff or slipped the cuffs and threw the drink at the other deputy. Who was driving? Uh, Detective Riley was driving. Okay, your front passenger seat? That's correct. Okay, where was the other deputies? Deputy Michaela James was seated next to her behind uh, Detective Riley. Okay, and was Miss Stouch seated directly behind you? Yes, she was. Okay. Did you nap during this ride any, fall asleep, or were you awake and aware the whole time? No, I wasn't able to sleep. Okay. Now, you said that uh, Ms. Stauk and your encounters with her uh, seemed calm and collected. 
I said she seemed calm, yes. Okay. <laughs> and then she seemed like she wasn't switching between personalities? No. Okay. <clears throat> so there was no switch in her personality from when she was calm for 24 hours in the van till she slipped her cuffs and assaulted a deputy? Was there no change in her behavior at that point, in your opinion? There was a change in her behavior, but I don't believe a change in her personality. Okay. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Uh, Ms. Bethel, do you know what this is? It's a diagnostic and statistical manual of medical, or excuse me, mental disorders. Okay. And you see right there, it says DSM-5. Yes. DSM-5. Uh, do you know what this book is? It's a mental disorder book, I assume. Okay. Have you ever seen it before or ever read it? No. Okay. Did you know in the field of psychiatry that this is more or less the Bible for diagnosing psychiatric disorders? No. Okay. And did you know that borderline personality disorders is listed in this DSM-5 manual? Um, she's already said that she's not familiar with the book. Yeah, I'm trying to understand where you're going. She's not, she's not being Your Honor, can we approach? Objection sustained. You can rephrase. So, uh, Miss Bethel, your definition of sanity that you told uh, Mr. Allen that you believe Ms. Stouch was with your dealings with her, it is not based on the definition of sanity is contained in the DSM-5. Oh, uh, Judge, I would just further object. There's no definition of sanity in that well, you can cross me. You can examine somebody about that to your heart's content, but the question is a fair one, uh, overruled. And let me rephrase. When you told Mr. Allen that Ms. Douch was saying, you're not basing that opinion on anything found in this book, the DSM-5, correct? That's correct. Okay. Just a moment, Your Honor. All right. That's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Redirect. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> How long have you been in law enforcement prior to you leaving the sheriff's office? 14 years. Um, during your um, time with the sheriff's office, uh, what were your different duties? I began my career as a civilian, and I worked with inmates incarcerated at the, at the El Paso County Criminal Justice Center. Uh, from there, I became a deputy in 2010. Um, and received the, my post training to become a peace officer. Uh, and then from there I worked on patrol and ultimately in two investigations. In your experience of working at, at detentions at the jail, um, would you have contact with people that are suffering from mental health disorders? Yes. Would it happen fairly often? Yes. 
Um, during your time with um, Sheriff's Office, did you also have contact with lots of people in the public? Yes. Did you see people in the public that had um, mental health disorders? Yes, I did. During your time as a um, working at the Sheriff's Office, did you encounter people that had severe mental health disorders? Yes. Um, did you have contact with people that had um, con that you might have had concerns with that they may be a threat to themselves or others, their safety? Yes. Uh, did this defendant ever get anywhere close to that during your interactions with her? No. Thank you. The jurors have any questions for Ms. Bethel? All right. Looks like we have at least yeah. one. Council approach, please. <laughs> Um, I've received a juror question, and um, you might uh, be sort of thinking ahead. There are some other witnesses. I think that those questions are uh, these questions may be able to be answered through, but not this particular one. Um, so, with that, Ms. Bethel, you can step down. Thank you. I'm going to retrieve the exhibit off the witness stand, Judge. Okay. You already did. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, prosecution, call your next witness, please. <laughs> Christian Warner. I'm sorry, who was the witness? Christian Leeward. Leeward. All right. L -I -E you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, sir. Do you swear from the testimony about to give this man will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. 
see too many people bring a camera up with them. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll explain. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, would you state your name for the record and also spell your last name? My name is Christian, and my last name is spelled L-I-E-W-E-R, and it's pronounced Leewer. And where are you employed? I am a crime scene investigator with the Colorado Springs Metro Crime Lab. And how long have you been employed with the Metro Crime Lab? I've been employed with the Metro Crime Lab for a little under four years now. And in terms of your role with the Metro Crime Lab, generally, what do you do? Um, as a crime scene investigator, we respond to scenes, vehicle processings, autopsies, and person processings for general documentation and evidence collection purposes. Can you tell a little uh, the jury a bit more about what type of educational background you need to perform that particular role? I have a bachelor's of science in criminal justice with an emphasis in forensic investigation. And I also have a master's degree in forensic science from the University of Florida. In terms of certifications that you hold, can you explain the jury uh, some of those? <laughs> Current um, national um, certifications. But through our crime lab training program, we have to go through a six-month training program where we are reviewed and observed by a, um, by a certified crime scene investigator until we are deemed competent enough to perform crime scene investigations independently. What about continuing education or things that you do on an annual basis to ensure that you're up to date with the current technology and science? What do you do? We respond, or we go to many trainings um, within our scope of um, work. That includes blood stain pattern analysis, shooting incident reconstruction, um, latent print processing, and whatnot. And how many uh, scenes have you responded to over the course of your career thus far? I've responded to approximately 75 crime scenes um, and a total of approximately 220 total callouts. And the 75 crime scenes, was that specifically as your role as a crime scene investigator? That is correct, yes. And how many times have you testified in an expert capacity? Um, a little bit under 10 times now. And specifically, what capacity was that? Uh, crime scene investigation. Okay. And were all those in this jurisdiction? Yes, they were. Uh, your Honor, at this time, the people who tendered to the court, Christian Lee, were as an expert in crime scene investigations. Oh, good. Witness will be so qualified. All right. Mr. Leewer, I'd like for you to explain to the jury your role as it relates to the disappearance um, of Gannon Stouk, as you understood it from the get-go. How did your role start? Absolutely. Um, on February 3rd, um, I was informed that I was requested to respond to 6627 Mandan Drive to complete a search for latent blood stains and or projectile defects within the residence regarding um, a missing child. And what was the specific address you were tasked with responding to? 6627 Mandan Drive. And is that in the county of El Paso? That is in the county of El Paso. State of Colorado? In the state of Colorado. Uh, you mentioned um, that particular response. How many responses did you ultimately have to that residence? I responded to that residence three times. And can you break down for the jury each one of those responses, the dates and the times approximately? Absolutely. Um, as I alluded to before, I responded a little bit before lunchtime on February 3rd. I responded later in the evening around 6 p.m. also on February 3rd. And then I also responded on February 5th around a little bit after lunchtime. And in terms of the Metro Crime Lab, how many uh, people were you generally working with uh, for your role in this case? Each of my responses, I was, um, I had a, an additional CSI that was in training with me. And then there were two other crime scene investigators that also responded on multiple days to the address. So subsequent to your last time at the residence on February 5th, were there additional uh, crime scene investigators that were present that helped process the scene or collect evidence? Yes, there were. Now, you mentioned that you were tasked, uh, briefed with some additional information regarding looking for latent blood stains. Can you explain to the jury in very basic terms what you mean by blood and blood stains? 
So blood, as you all know, is the red fluid that runs through your body that does contain genetic code and carries oxygen. Um, when I refer to latent blood stains in a crime scene, I mean blood stains that are either very dilute or cleaned up to where you cannot see them anymore. So we have to use additional processing to make them visible. And generally, what is contained in blood? Why is it important to you and what you do? In a broad sense, what we're concerned about when it comes to blood is the genetic code or your DNA that we, um, that we are trying to collect with blood stains. And so in terms of your processing, is your role uh, related to collecting, uh, preserving uh, blood or DNA for additional uh, use by your team? Yes, it is. Our role is to document and collect as much as we can. Okay. Uh, now you mentioned um, collecting, documenting. What is the specific tool that you may use when you're given information that a scene may involve blood? There are multiple options that we have when it comes to um, looking at blood stains. However, when we are looking at latent blood stains, we will use a, a chemical called Blue Star that will assist us in visualizing the blood stains. And generally, what is what is Blue Star? Blue Star is a presumptive test for blood, meaning that it will react with blood, but it can react with multiple other um, multiple other substances. However, with Blue Star, when it reacts with the heme component of blood stains, it will chemiluminesce or glow a bright blue color in the dark. You said heme. Correct. Heme. What What do you mean by that? It's a molecule in the blood that specifically is targeted by um, Blue Star in our presumptive testing. So while Blue Star can uh, presumptively test positive for blood, can it presumptively test positive for other substances? It can. Most of what it will react to is any oxidizing agent, which can include um, cleaning agents, um, bleach, uh, even horseradish. So it's presumptive in the sense that we can search for blood, but there has to be additional testing to determine if it is blood and if there is any DNA present in that sample. You want our permission to approach the witness? You may. <laughs> Mr. Lieber, do you generally recognize what I'm holding here, which has been marked as People's Exhibit 442? Yes, I do. How do you recognize it? This is a diagram that I created of the main level and the basement level of 6627 Mandan Drive. And generally, uh, are there various markings on this uh, exhibit 442? Yes, there are. It has the address, it has what level of the um, scene it is, and then there are also additional blue, yellow, and purple dots within the diagram that I placed indicating positive blue star reactions on my multiple um, visits. And is People's Exhibit 442 a fair and accurate representation of what you created with regard to the floor plan? Yes, it is. And at this time, we would move to admit People's Exhibit 442. No objection. Exhibit 442 will be admitted. Go ahead. <clears throat> Mr. Lure, there's a where there is a pointer. Uh, I'll ask you to use that as you walk through your testimony here. And is this the right positioning that you prefer for this? It's very big. It's fine. Okay. It, it's most important that the jury be able to see it. I think maybe if you cant it a little bit, turn it the other way. Which way, you're Like this. Other way. Facing the jury. There you go. There you go. We're good now? Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lieber, can you walk the jury through uh, the diagram that appears in People's Exhibit 442, uh, basically out of the house? Absolutely. Is it okay if I stand up next to the diagram as well? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, but if you're going to do that, you'll need to stand to one side or the other so that the, the jurors at the far end will still be able to see. So you just need to stand on one side or the other of the diagram. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. Thank you. So as you can see on the top of the diagram of the first section of this, that is going to be the main level of 6627 Mandan Drive. 
And when it relates to my crime scene processing, my first response was predominantly focused on the, in the upper right hand corner over here. That is the garage. We were tasked with searching for latent blood stains in the garage earlier that day. Um, as you can see at the bottom left corner of the garage, there's a doorway that will open into the laundry room, which the laundry room will continue to open into the main level of the home. Towards the center of this top half of the diagram, there is a stairwell. This stairwell uh, leads to the basement, um, which the basement is highlighted on the bottom level or the bottom half of this diagram. Can you guys see the bottom half over there? Is it okay if I move the diagram slightly? That's fine. That? And Your Honor, uh, if the jurors need to stand up or move around to see the diagram, would that be permissible uh, yeah, in, their, in their chair? Yeah, if you need to speculate the guys in the hole over there. That's <laughs> and uh, Mr. Leeward, just so uh, we can make sure that your voice is projected, uh, just make sure that your voice is projecting. Absolutely. Can you all see the whole diagram now? Fantastic. So can, can all of the jurors hear him? We have a microphone if it would be helpful, but if everybody can hear him. Okay. Everybody's nodding. It's all good. So on the bottom half of this diagram, this is the basement level. And towards the middle of the bottom half of the diagram, you can see the stairwell again. This is the stairwell that connected the upper level and the lower level. But now on the bottom right side of this half of the diagram, you'll see two rooms. The room to the bottom is the southeast bedroom, which I was informed was Gannon's room. And then the room above Gannon's room, that is a storage room or storage closet that I also searched for Blue Star. And then towards the left side of this diagram, you have uh, an entertainment area in the bottom left corner. And in the upper left corner, you have a bathroom, an additional bedroom, and an additional walk-in closet. Great. And so uh, when you responded initially to the residents on February 3rd of 2020, can you walk the jury through what your method of approach when you approach a scene is? Absolutely. When we respond to a scene in any capacity, we will all we will always go at it in the least intrusive measures. That means I will work outside to inside. So in this case, I was tasked with searching for blood stains within the garage, between the garage and his bedroom. Because I don't want to go to the most intrusive method, I'm not going to go straight to his bedroom. I'm going to start in the garage and work my way down. And that's the same with any crime scene. We'll always start outside and get closer to what is of interest. Okay. And um, you can take a seat. I'm going to ask you to look at a set of photos. Uh, you're on a permission to approach the witness with what has been marked previously provided to the defense <laughs> as people's exhibits 443 through 450. 450. 443 through 450, Your Honor. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Mr. Leeward, can you take a moment to uh, familiarize yourself with that set of exhibits? Absolutely. And do you recognize people's exhibits 443 through 450? Yes, I do. How do you recognize them? These are photographs that I took during my initial visit or my initial processing um, the morning of February 3rd. And are they a fair and accurate depiction of what you saw during your initial processing on February 3rd of 2020? Yes, they are. Your Honor, at this time, uh, the people would move to admit people's exhibits 443 through 450 and permission to publish. No objection. Uh, exhibits 443 through 450 will be admitted. Uh, Mr. Leeward, whatever is going to work better for you, if you want to stand between the screen and the diagram, I'll defer to you. Absolutely. But I will ask you to point out various locations on People's Exhibit 442. Absolutely. I'm, and, sorry, go ahead. I'm going to stand in front of the diagram so I can turn and show the, the best way for you, for the jury.
Uh, now, Mr. Leeward, you've explained that you approach a scene from the outside moving inwards. And so what we see in People's Exhibit 443, what are you documenting here? I'm documenting the front side of the residence. So I am facing south towards the garage. And what's important here is during our overall photographs, we want to document what address we are at. So along the right hand side of this image, you can see 662 and then something covering the bottom part. But this is the overall view of the front of 6627 Mandate Drive. People's Exhibit 444, what are you documenting here? This is an overall photograph of the interior of the garage. I'm standing in the northeast corner facing southwest towards the laundry room. People's Exhibit 445. Now I'm standing in the southeast corner of the garage. And again, I'm facing west towards the laundry room. People's Exhibit 446. Standing in the southwest corner of the garage facing east. So I'm standing right in front of the stairway to the laundry room. People's Exhibit 447. This is right at the base of the stairs to the laundry room. Mm -hmm. And I'm showing that there's a rug there and stairs leading into the laundry room. Now, as you're walking through this garage area, how do you know which areas of the garage to specifically focus on? There are multiple case considerations we have to take into. For example, the question was if there were latent blood stains between the garage and his bedroom. Um, it's not observed in these photographs yet, but there is a, a woodworking shop in the garage that would have been difficult for a vehicle to be parked or anybody to be present. So what we focused on were the open areas where you could walk or park a vehicle. And in terms of the scope, that you're allowed to document and process when you're on a scene, is that dictated by anything? Yes, we have to work within the parameters of a search warrant. If there's something that we want to collect that are outside of the search, uh, outside of the search warrant, we have to apply for another search warrant to be able to collect that. And that goes uh, directly to uh, my first question really should have been, are you just allowed to walk into a house and start processing? No, we are not. We are initially first requested by a law enforcement agency, traditionally the Sheriff's Office or Colorado Springs Police Department. And once they receive a search warrant, we are able to enter a home for our documentation and evidence collection purposes. And so now what we see in People's Exhibit 447 is a piece of carpet. Um, what was important for you to do next um, when you observe this piece of carpet? For the purposes of what we were doing, again, we were searching for latent blood stains. So our next step was to start spraying the garage with Blue Star to see if we could get a chemiluminescence. And can you explain for the jury uh, the steps in very basic steps of even just beginning to spray Blue Star? Where do you get it? So Blue Star is a proprietary chemical and it comes in two vials. We have to put these two vials with a certain amount of distilled water and mix that up. Once it is mixed up in a spray bottle, we will lightly spray over wherever we are trying to search for blood stains, and we lightly spray over it um, because it will fluoresce or it will chemiluminesce very quickly. And once we see the chemiluminescence, we will traditionally we'll try to photograph it. But what's most important is that we swab it and note it. In terms of timing, is that important when you know that you're going to use Blue Star to when you start spraying it? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Timing, is that important when you're using Blue Star? Can you, uh, you know, mix the reagent and use it for three hours later? Is that important? Does it matter? So there is a, a shelf life to Blue Star, but we are able to use it for, um, if we mix it when we initially get to a crime scene, we're able to continue using it throughout the duration of the crime scene, whether it be a day or not. Okay, and People's Exhibit 448, Again, what are we seeing here? Uh, People's Exhibit 448 is another photograph from that same location. However, now I've slightly moved up to show in relation to where the doorway is, where I was standing. People's 449. This is another photograph of the rug, but it's taking facing southwest now. So it's just an additional angle of the stairwell and the, and the rug itself. And 
specifically with regard to those stairs, is there a difference um, how these stairs appear now versus the other photos that we've seen? Absolutely. In the previous images, the stairs were dry and kind of a lighter shade, but now you can see that they're a darker shade. That is because I had sprayed Blue Star on these stairs, um, resulting in them being saturated. People's Exhibit 450. What are we looking at here? People's Exhibit 450 is a Blue Star photograph showing the chemiluminescence of the positive reaction with Blue Star, um, predominantly on the rug and slightly west of the rug. And in terms of photographing Blue Star, um, are there anything that you encountered when you were there on February 3rd of 2020 that morning? When it comes to photographing Blue Star, it is difficult to photograph because you have to manually control many settings on your camera that force a certain amount of light in for a certain period of time. So we have very high powered cameras that we can adjust those settings to take photographs like this. Um, and would now be a good time to use your camera? Absolutely. Okay. We did see you walk up to the stand uh, with the camera. Would explaining um, how Blue Star is photographed uh, and using that camera be helpful for you in demonstrating that to the jury? Your Honor, permission for the witness to use his camera for demonstrative purposes only? Defense? No objection. You may. Go ahead. Now, Mr. Lewer, uh, you started to explain the fancy settings of your camera. Can you explain that to the jury? Absolutely. So what I have here is a Nikon D500 camera. And the reason we use these, like I said before, is that we can manually adjust many settings on this camera to take photographs that you normally wouldn't be able to on your cell phone. <laughs> so we're predominantly concerned with three settings in general. The aperture, which if you look at the front of the lens here, that's the opening in which the light will come in. That's kind of like the pupil of your eye. We're concerned with the ISO setting, which is simply saying how sensitive the camera is to light itself. So if I have a higher ISO, that means photographs will appear brighter because it's more sensitive to light. And then additionally, when I take this lens off, being very careful, um, you can see here there's this mirror. There's going to be a shutter in here. That's what opens and closes when you, we're trying to capture a photograph. And the reason that is important is because we have to focus on the shutter speed of a of our camera. And what that means is if I have a very fast shutter speed, it means it opens and, opens and closes very fast, not letting much light in. But if I have the shutter speed open for a very long time, it allows more light to come in, meaning I can take photographs in the dark that are brighter, but that can also show the chemiluminescence of Blue Star. Additionally, I didn't bring it up, but the aperture is an additional way to allow light in. But for the purposes of Blue Star, it is predominantly the shutter speed that we are concerned with. Now, what are the ideal conditions to even do this photography in? With Blue Star, you have to have a dark room. It doesn't have to be completely dark, but to see a reaction, it has to be mostly dark. So with that being said, we have to have our camera settings allowing us to take photographs in the dark with very minimum light. And I apologize. I was going to say, but as you can see here in the bottom portion of this photo, you can see that there is some light. We have to have some light present within the scene to show what the conditions look like with the blue star candy luminescence, because it doesn't really tell much if we have bright blue, but nothing behind it to, to show what it's on. Uh, can you walk the uh, jury through the different areas where reaction is being observed here in People's Exhibit 450? Absolutely. So this is at the base of the stairs leading to the laundry room in the garage. So this is along the south wall of the garage in the southwest corner. And would you point that out on People's Exhibit 442 for the jury as well? Like I said before, the upper half of this diagram is the main level of the residence. Um, in the upper right hand corner, that is the garage. Um, you can see along the south or the bottom wall of this diagram that there are many blue dots. Each blue dot represents a blue star reaction that I had on my first visit on February 3rd. Going forward, the green dots will be my second visit and the purple dots will be my third visit. But we, I'm, I'm sure we'll get there. So after you see this positive reaction in People's Exhibit 450, what is your next step? 
when we have a blue star positive reaction, we have to consider the substrate that it's on or what, what the blue star is reacting with. So in this case, we have a rug that we could easily collect. So we just collect that easily. However, if we have blue star reactions on a wall or floor, we can't collect the wall or the floor. So we'll have to collect a sample of that blue star reaction itself. Your Honor, uh, permission to approach the witness uh, with People's Exhibit 451, and I will show it to the defense as well. All right. Mr. Lee, would you recognize People's Exhibit 451? Could I handle it real fast? Yes, sir. Thank you. I do recognize this. How do you recognize it? This is the rug that I collected from the base of those stairs. And the reason I recognize it is the label has the description of where it came from. It has my employee ID number as well as the item number. And then there are additional tape seals on the back with my initials and the date that it was sealed up. However, there are additional tape seals and markings on the rug indicating it has been examined by further lab personnel. Aside from those differences that you pointed out, would you say that it is in the same or substantially same condition as when you last observed and collected it? Yes, it is. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, we would move for the admission of People's Exhibit 451. Mr. Exhibit 451 will be admitted. Go ahead. Okay. Now, after um, you note the reaction in People's Exhibit 450, what do we see now in People's Exhibit 400 and, oh, sorry, whoops. Went ahead myself, Your Honor. Your Honor, permission to approach the witness with what has been marked as People's Exhibits 452 through 458. Exhibit 452 through 458 will be admitted. Thank you. No, uh, the, no objection to those. I'll lay the exhibits. foundation, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Lewer, uh, would you take a moment, familiarize yourself with People's Exhibit 452 through 458? Absolutely. How do you recognize those exhibits? These are additional photographs that I took during my first um, visit to 6627 Mandan Drive. And generally, what area uh, do those photos show? Generally, this is going to be along the south wall of the garage. And are they a fair and accurate depiction of what you saw that day? Yes, they are. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, we now move for the admission of people's exhibits 452 through 458. I still have no objection. Okay. Thank you. Exhibits 452 through 458 will be admitted. Now we can show 452. All right. Uh, Mr. Lewer, can you explain to the jury what we're looking at in People's Exhibit 452? So as you can see along the right-hand side of this image, you can see the, the carpet that we've alluded to before. So this is facing, or this is slightly east of that carpet looking at the floor. In 453, what are we seeing now? This is a blue star photograph of the ground nearby the, nearby the rug. Now, um, is this fair to say that this is a bit brighter? Yes. Okay. And when you see this blue star reaction, again, <laughs> what is important for you to do next? Again, what's important most is to document it in our notes and, photo and uh, collect a sample of it. <laughs> People's Exhibit 454. What are you documenting here? This is a photograph of a military backpack along the south wall of the garage. 
455. This is a photograph of that bag moved, so we can search for blue star reactions with underneath the bag. 456. And this is a blue star positive reaction photograph after the bag had been removed. 457. We've rotated slightly to the east. This is a photograph of the southeast corner of the garage, highlighting those boards and the box directly south of the boards. And 458. This is a positive blue star reaction on the boards and on that box that I've alluded to. Your Honor, permission to approach the witness with what has been marked as People's Exhibit 459. You may go ahead. Mr. Viewer, do you recognize People's Exhibit 459? Yes, I do. How do you recognize it? This is uh, an envelope with swabs that I collected of the positive blue star reactions within the garage. And again, this is based on the label indicating where it came from with my employee ID number and the tape seals. And again, there are additional tape seals um, indicating that this has been examined by additional lab personnel. And in terms of the various um, swabbings that you did in that area, um, area of interest for you in People's Exhibit 458, um, are those swabs contained in People's Exhibit 459? Yes, they are. If there was a blue star reaction and it was swabbed, it is um, collected and placed in this envelope. And again, is that envelope same or substantially same, uh, given the differences that you've pointed out to the jury? Other than the additional tape seals, then yes, it would be. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, we would be moved for the admission of People's Exhibit 459. Mr. Tolini? No objection. Exhibit 459 will be admitted. Go ahead. Uh, now, Mr. Lewer, uh, can you, there's um, some particular areas um, that you noted in People's 458, and just to be clear, the reaction includes the boards, but it also includes another object? Yes, it does. As you can see, the multiple boards in this photograph have a blue star reaction. But if you look at the box to the top of this image, there are also some, there's some blue chemiluminescence that was swabbed, whereas the boards were collected. And can you just clarify for the jury on People's Exhibit 442 uh, where that uh, reaction is taking place? Absolutely. As we can see on the top right hand portion of the main level in the diet, we have three dots on the southeast corner of the garage. That's going to include the box as well as the boards in the photograph that you see here. Your Honor, promotion to approach the witness with what has been marked as People's Exhibits 460 through 476. You may. Thank you. For that set of exhibits, Mr. Leewer, do you recognize those? Let me take a look. So much. I appreciate you. You're going to approach the witness. These are slippery. Sorry? Permission to approach the witness. The pictures are pretty Oh, slippery. yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. All right, do you generally recognize people's exhibits 460 through, I believe, 477? Yes, I do. These are additional photographs that I took during my first scene processing. And Your Honor, sorry, just to clarify, uh, 460 through 476 is actually the, the number of exhibits there. Right. Go ahead. Are they fair and accurate? Yes, they are. Your Honor, at this time, we would move for the admission of people's exhibits uh, 460 through 476. Mr. Tolini? No objection. Exhibits 460 through 476 will be admitted. 
Now, Mr. Leeward, behind you is People's Exhibit 460. You'd mentioned uh, some presumptive positive reactions that you noticed with the boards. What are you documenting in People's Exhibit 460? What I'm documenting here is that there was initially an additional black bag um, right in the center of the photograph to the right or the east of the last board. And I moved that bag and that's what I'm photographing in, in, this, in this depiction right here. In 461, what are we seeing here? This is a blue star positive reaction photograph slightly east of those boards and on the boards as well. 462. This is a photograph directly of the boards at their south end. 463. Again, a blue star positive reaction photograph. It's difficult to see, um, but it, it's on the, the farthest bottom board or the farthest east board in this photograph. And uh, Mr. Leeward, would you use the pointer just to point that out to the jury? So using the pointer, um, it's going to be slightly in the middle of this image, but it's going to be the board that we are going to refer to as, I believe, four. And it's this blue chemiluminescence towards the center on the screen right here. People's 464. This is another photograph of the boards. But as you can see towards the bottom of the image now, I've labeled the boards. I've labeled north, and I've given them arbitrary numbers as one through four. And would you point that out to the jury as well? Absolutely. So um, I previously testified that that board was number four. It was actually number one. I apologize for that. But here on the bottom side of this image, you can see towards the center of these boards, I've labeled them one, two, three, and four. I've indicated a north arrow, and I've written top, indicating that that is the top of the board. 465. This is a close-up image of that information. 466. This is after I cut the boards. We decided to do this because the boards were very long. They spanned the entire length of the garage. So instead of having to contain all of the, the board, we cut the samples that we had presumptive positive reactions on. And would these boards now be made available to other members of law enforcement or other people for additional access? Yes, they would. People's Exhibit 467, can you orient the jury as to where we're at now? Absolutely. This is kind of a difficult photograph to discern where we are. But along the left side of this image, you can kind of see the end of a stairwell. And on the diagram here, in the bottom left side of the garage, we're in the southwest corner looking directly in that corner. So where the rug initially was, it'll be slightly west of that. People's 468. This is a blue star reaction underneath the items within that southwest corner. 469. We've moved some of those items to better visualize what was under those items. 470. An additional blue star reaction photograph of that same area. Now, you did explain that you like to work outside in, and so as you've documented various areas around the garage, what is the next area of focus for you? Naturally, our next indication would be to move into the garage. So what we did after we blue star this area was move further into the, into the laundry room. So in People's Exhibit 471, what are you documenting here? This is a photograph of the door to the laundry room but we're within the garage. We have not crossed that threshold yet. And People's Exhibit 472. This is a blue star positive reaction photograph, and it's kind of difficult to see, but at the top of this image, towards the middle of the screen, there is a blue marking on the door. People's Exhibit 473. This is a photograph once we've opened up the doorway to the laundry room. People's Exhibit 474. This is a photograph of Blue Star positive reactions on the floor of the laundry room. Again, it may be a little bit difficult to see, but it's right on the floor, right as you cross the threshold, and it's towards the center of this of the image. Uh, people's 475. Now we're standing within the laundry room, facing the doorway and uh, looking at the ground towards what would be the entrance of the home. People's 476. Additional blue star reactions along that floor between the doors of the home and the laundry room. And Mr. Lee, would you go ahead and point out those different spots for the jury? Absolutely. 
So um, we can see the washer and dryer along the left side of the screen. And we can also see some laundry baskets on the right hand of this image. And we're facing south now. So you can see this, some of these blue speckles along that walkway between the washer and dryer and the laundry baskets. And are you also documenting that on People's Exhibit 442? I am. So you can see we've alluded that the, the garage is in the upper left-hand corner. Now, as you move south, you can see the doorway. And this linear stretch that orients north-south, that is the laundry room. And you can see three dots of uh, three blue dots indicating the positive blue star reactions that I uh, I mean. However, the three is arbitrary. It's documenting the location. It's not the number of reactions we saw. And People's Exhibit 400 and, let's see. You can take a seat now if you'd like. Get some now, you in. at some point, you'd explained that uh, certain ideal conditions for photographing Blue Star. Um, at what point in the day are you now uh, coming back? Can you explain that again to the jury? So as I mentioned before, we are there around noon, the noontime, so very bright outside. You can see that in this image depicted that there's light coming in underneath the doorway, which can be <laughs> troublesome when we're trying to take very dark photographs for a Blue Star. So at this point, we decided with the amount of blue star reactions that were observed, that it would be beneficial to respond to the address in the evening hours to search for blue star. So because we could make the house darker. And did you actually respond uh, later in the evening hours on February 3rd of 2020? Yes, I did. I responded around 6 p.m. And did you respond with anybody else from your team? CSI Robert Zaleski responded with me in a training capacity. And your honor, uh, permission to approach. You may. You. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> sure. I was confused as well. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our uh, uh, lunch recess. If I can have uh, everyone back in the jury room, uh, say 120, we should be able to start on time at that point. Again, don't discuss the case among yourself. Don't discuss the case with anyone else. And, we'll, and have a good lunch. We'll see you back at 120. All rise for the jury, please. I we're just going to need a different set of some good stuff in. Which that one is way out in my courtroom. Let's bring that down to the front room. Who the fuck? I mean, just. I don't want to have it on the other. I don't think we have one that's in the middle. We have ours, and we'll take that. Time. 120. Thank you. You may all be seated. Record should reflect the jury has left the courtroom. Is there anything that uh, we need to take up outside the presence of the jury at this point in time? Press Nothing press. from the people, Your Honor. Defense? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All rise. Court will be in recess then. Thank you.
All right. Okay. Court will call 20 CR 1358 People versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury is not present in the courtroom. Is there anything we need to take up outside the presence of the jury at this point in time? Not from the people, Your Honor. Yes. No, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and bring the jury in. And Ms. Gratiano, you can move that once the jury gets in and whenever you're ready. Yes, Your Honor. I'll do that. That's why I see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. All rise from the jury, please. Thank you. you. May all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358 People versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Uh, when we took our break, we were in the midst of uh, the testimony of Mr. Lewier. That's where we will uh, resume. Uh, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Gratiano. Yep, and we'll continue on. Well, good afternoon now. Everyone. Uh, Your Honor, permission to approach to move the easel? You may. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Lee, we're, we were at a good point where you've now transitioned to another part of the house. Uh, I would like to take a moment to, to take a step back. Uh, there are two exhibits, I believe, in front of you. I just have the one. Sorry? I just have uh, one photograph. One, oh, right, one photograph. And what photograph uh, exhibit is that previously admitted? This is People's Exhibit 446. I project that. Mr. Lieber, if you can take a moment to point out um, some, some specific items that we see in People's Exhibit 446. Next to the boards, you testified about a bag that you'd moved, done some Blue Star uh, on. But can you point out that bag in People's 446? Absolutely. So as you can see in the center of the screen, you see a blue bag next to the boards that mm -hmm. I've testified about. Um, this bag uh, appeared to be a softball bag or used for softball materials, but I did not open it to examine what was in there. And can you point out that bag? Um, to be clear, uh, there may be maybe two bags in that uh, particular photo. Can you point out each of those bags? Absolutely. The I'm going to stand up if that's okay with you. Go ahead. Thank you. So as you can see in the center of this image here, the blue bag I was referring to earlier, there's a big E in the middle of it. But additionally, there is a box to the south end of the boards. There's also another Easton bag with what appears to be a pink softball bat as well. Thank you. Uh, now you'd explained that your uh, work on February 3rd of 2020 was split basically into two parts. Um, the second part was to maximize uh, the advantage of what? 
we wanted to respond again in the evening to take advantage of the darkness so we could see the blue star reactions if present. Okay. Uh, and in terms of that, uh, were you able to document any uh, blue star reactions that you noticed? Yes, we were. Um, we were able to document it via notes and some photographs. There was a camera malfunction during my response, um, which I can explain in further detail. Go ahead. So I mentioned before the shutter of a camera is what opens and closes for a photograph to be taken. And that when we take our blue star photography, we want to make sure the shutter is open as long and as long as we can to get as much light in. So traditionally, if you have a shutter that is open for a very long time, you're going to have a brighter and brighter photograph. Uh, with my camera, there was a shutter issue where I had my shutter open for a very long time, 30 seconds, and my pictures were coming out almost completely dark. With, and there was a weird noise that my camera was making. So we equated this to a shutter malfunction. So instead of trying to photograph and continually diluting the blue star reaction, we decided it would be best to make a note of it and, and sample it directly. Because if we kept trying to photograph the, the reaction, eventually that would continually dilute the sample, which would make it more difficult for a DNA sample to be pulled from it. So in a long-winded answer, we had issues with the camera shutter. So instead of trying to photograph it, we took swabs and noted it immediately. And the camera was eventually replaced that year as well. So, uh, Your Honor, permission to approach with what has been marked as People's Exhibits 477, 486 through 502, previously provided to the defense. All right, go ahead. Yes, you familiarize yourself with the exhibits that I've handed you. Absolutely. Mr. Leeward, do you recognize those? I do. These are photographs that I took during my second visit or the evening of February 3rd, 2020. And in terms of um, the documentation that you did, uh, you were able to actually use your camera, but uh, as far as some of the documentation for uh, lighting and things like that, that became problematic with the Blue Star, right? That is correct. During the second visit we were there, the CSI Robert Zaleski had his camera. I did switch to that momentarily to photograph some blue star reactions, but overall my camera was having those shutter issues. So again, we predominantly decided that it would be best to note and swab. And our people's exhibits 477, 486 through 502 a fair and accurate representation of what you saw that day. Yes, they are. Your Honor, at this time we would move for the admission of People's Exhibits 477, 486 through 502. Yes. No, uh, exhibits 477 and 486 through 502 will be admitted. Go ahead. Great. Uh, Mr. Leo, what we have projected here is People's Exhibit 477. Uh, why did you document this? This is uh, an overall photograph of the storage room that's in the basement and depicted on the diagram here, we have um, the child's bedroom in the southeast corner of the bottom half of this diagram and that storage room just north of it, that's what I'm photographing here. And when we do our crime scene processing, we will take overalls of every room to document how it looks before we begin our processing. So this is one of those photos. Um, in relation to where this location is at, 
it's in the northeast corner of this room facing east. So when you walk in, it's the, the wall on the farthest. And as a part of the Metro Crime Lab, uh, fair to say other members of the team also uh, did crime scene work in that room as well? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, if we can mute the screen so I can move forward. Yep. Great, thank you, Your Honor. You can go ahead and unmute it. I uh, appreciate it, Your Honor. Great. Uh, oh, I lost it. Thank you. And now as you move forward throughout the house, uh, continuing your documentation with specific areas of the house, what are we seeing in People's Exhibit 486? This is uh, a difficult photograph to recognize because we don't have any labels for it. Um, traditionally, when we see visible possible blood stains, we will label them. But with how small what I observed here was, I didn't want to lose it. So what we're looking at here is um, that first landing. And when I refer to the landings, the first one, we're referring to going downstairs. So the first landing is the first one you hit when you're going down the stairs. The second one is the second landing when you're going down the stairs. So in this diagram, in the center of the first of the top level, it's going to be this north wall of the first landing. And it's kind of, you can't see it, but there's a, a zoomed in photograph. Okay. The zoomed in photograph that you're referring to, would that be people's 487? Yes, it is. That there was a red possible biological sample on that north wall that we've thought it would be probative to take a sample of. Okay. Uh, people's 488, can you orient the jury as to where we are now? So now we are in the Southeast bedroom, Organa's bedroom. And this is the location. This is right when you're standing in the doorway. So we're standing in the doorway um, at the top left side of his room on this diagram, facing the Southeast corner. People's 489. This is another photograph of that corner. However, now we're standing in the Northeast corner facing Southeast. People's 490. This is the direct east wall of that corner we were just referring to. And based on what you're looking at here, photographing this particular wall, um, are there any uh, apparent uh, abnormalities that you're seeing when you look at this photo in terms of blood? Overall, no, but there were observations later made, but at the time there weren't. Okay. Uh, people's 491. So this is another photograph of the southeast corner. It is very yellow because we will take a photograph before we do any blue star without any flash photography. So it will come out usually this yellowish hue. So this is the photograph I took for any blue star processing. And then the, the, any photographs subsequent to that will be of that blue star reaction in the same exact location. And Mr. Lewer, are you familiar with what object generally is in that corner of that bedroom? I was informed that there was a bed there at one point. And by the time you'd enter that room, had that bed been removed? Correct. I did not observe a bed in that corner. However, I did observe a bed in the southwest corner, so on the opposite side of this corner. Uh, People's Exhibit 492. Can you explain to the jury what you've documented here? This is a the photograph from that corner. This is a blue star reaction. And this is after I did switch cameras on the second visit or the second processing. But this is a blue star reaction with blue and whitish blue chemiluminescence around that southeast corner. And Mr. Leo, would you be able to use the pointer to distinguish between uh, the floor versus the wall area? Absolutely. So with this photograph being so dark, it may be difficult to tell. But towards the bottom of the screen here, you can see kind of a white upside down V. To the upper left side of that V is the east wall of the room. To the upper right hand side of that V is the south wall. And then directly below that upside down V is the floor of that corner of the room. And based on the color of the reaction that you see here, uh, is there anything that you can say or opine uh, as to the color and what that means? So with it being a blue chemiluminescence, it is presumptive positive, is a presumptive positive reaction with blue star, indicating that it could be blood. People's Exhibit 493. Uh, what are you looking at and documenting here? This is another 
photograph of the of an, the same reaction. However, the spray has been distributed differently, so that's why there's a different appearance now. But again, this is another uh, photograph of the presumptive positive reaction in that corner of the southeast bedroom. Compared to People's Exhibit 492, uh, would 493 show um, a greater height uh, of the of the wall? Um, or is that just additional spray that you put to document that? I wouldn't make any um, I wouldn't make any conclusions based on that alone, but because when you're spraying with Blue Star, you're spraying where you can, you may not be hitting every single possible area, possible blood stains, but I will say the reaction does span a higher level in this photograph than the previous photograph. People's Exhibit 494, what are you documenting here? So once we saw the Blue Star reaction uh, in that corner of the room and some discoloration on the carpet, we thought it would be probative to cut the carpet up to see if we could see any, any visible possible blood stains. And at that point, when we cut the carpet up, we saw a reddish brown stain consistent with blood stains on the underside of the carpet. And as we've gone through the prior exhibit showing the carpet, uh, was there any discoloration that was apparent on the top of the carpet as you documented? Yes, it was darker and brown, but it was, it was faint, um, but it was still present. And can you point out, um, let's see, on People's Exhibit 495, uh, what are you specifically showing in here? This is a zoomed in photo of the underside of the carpet, kind of highlighting that reddish brown possible, the area of possible blood stains. And given that you're seeing some possible blood stains soak through the carpet, uh, what's the next level or layer that you're interested in? When we're concerned about absorption, we're gonna continue on to see how far down it goes. So with carpet, traditionally, there's also padding underneath. So we pull that padding up, which will then have the concrete sublayer. So we're just trying to see how far down that absorption of any biological material will go. Uh, People's Exhibit 496. Uh, what have you documented here uh, with regard to the padding and the concrete flooring? So as I alluded to, we're gonna keep searching further down. This is after that padding has been pulled back. So now you can see there was an amount of saturation through the carpet and the padding that resulted on the concrete subfloor. And to be clear, the padding that we see with a large uh, reddish spot, would that, if it laid back down, would that go directly over the corner area uh, of that room below the socket? Correct. Any of the reddish stains you're seeing in this photo would have been superimposed on top of each other. So you're essentially peeling back a layers of an onion, so to speak? Absolutely. In People's Exhibit 497, um, what are you documenting here? This is the zoomed in photograph of the underside of that carpet padding, highlighting that reddish brown possible blood. In 498? Similarly, we're looking at that same staining on the concrete subfloor now. 499. As we kept pulling carpet back, we observed additional areas of possible uh, possible blood on the underside of the carpet. And here we're showing how far we pulled the carpet back and, and <clears throat> seeing additional possible blood stains. People's Exhibit 500. Uh, this is a close-up photo, but what are you focusing on here? So this is slightly rotated from the previous image, as you can tell by that cut-out help. But now in the center of the screen, you can see sort of a, a brownish stain there as well. We thought that would that was consistent with possible blood stains, so it's, we wanted to document and collect that as well. People's exhibit oh, oh, 501. Uh, I do see what you see here is uh, now some layers of measurement that you've applied to uh, the back of the carpet. What are we looking at here? We're looking at that same photograph that we just observed, but this time I put um, a scale down showing the size and dimensions of that possible blood stain. Uh, People's Exhibit 502. This is a, a further zoomed in photograph of that same area. Now, as you explained, uh, noticing that you likely think that it may be blood, um, are you going to blue star these areas? No, when we are using Blue Star, we will exclusively use that for latent blood stains. And the reason is if you have visible blood stains, you can sample that and test it later. However, you do not have that opportunity with latent blood stains because they are invisible, you can't see them. So if we were to have visible blood stains, all we're doing is diluting it further for any subsequent DNA testing. 
So when we saw this, we didn't want to test it any further. We wanted to cut it out and collect it in a way that it would be preserved best as possible. Your Honor, I approached and approach the witness with what has been marked as People's Exhibit 503 and 504, previously inspected by the defense. You may go ahead. Now, Mr. Leor, I'm going to ask you to look at what's been marked as People's Exhibit 504. And first here. Oh boy. 503. Perfect. You recognize it? I do. Could I look at the seals real fast? Yes, I do recognize this. This is that carpet that was directly in the southeast corner of the bedroom and it also includes the padding and again i recognize this based on the label indicating where it was at having my employee number and then the tape seals on it having my initials however with it being um having the package been open there were additional um, analyses done by additional forensic personnel no and that's specific to people's exhibit 504 i think just below that is 503 uh, can you also take a moment to inspect People's Exhibit 503 as well. Absolutely. This one was 503. Oh, okay. 504 then. And in terms of People's Exhibit 504, uh, you recognize it as well in the same way? Yes, this is the carpet sample from that second area of possible blood stains we observed. Um, I separated them out um, because there was enough of a delineation between the one um, blood stain pattern, possible blood stain pattern, and the second one. So this is that carpet and that padding, again, with the label and the additional tape seals that it is the same item. And would you say that's in the substantially same condition as when you last collected it? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, at this time we would move for the admission of People's Exhibits 503 and 504. No objection. Exhibits 503 and 504 will be admitted. Go ahead. Mr. Lieber, as you move forward in the room, you're continuing to document the different um, stains, et cetera, that you see in the room. Um, what else, in addition to blood, were you also tasked with looking for in terms of uh, defects, projectiles, that sort of thing? So when we were initially called, we were told to look for blood stains and defects or blatant blood stains and possible projectile defects. During that search, we didn't observe any additional or any defects at all, but we did do the searches for the latent blood stains. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, permission to approach the witness with what has been marked as People's Exhibits 505 through 509. You may. Go ahead. Do you generally recognize those? I do. How These do you are, recognize? Sorry. It's okay. These are photographs that were taken the evening of February 3rd during my scene processing. And uh, they include people's exhibits 505 through 509. Uh, are those also fair and accurate representations of what you saw that day? Yes, they are. Your Honor, we would move for the admission of people's exhibits 505 through 509. Okay. Exhibits 505 through 509 will be admitted. Go ahead. Uh, now, Mr. Lee, we're, we're seeing a lot of photos uh, of carpet. Uh, how many photos would you normally take at a scene? So during a crime scene processing, it's not abnormal to have anywhere between 500 to 1,000 plus photographs. Um, most <laughs> photographs we use are to show the conditions of the scene before, during, and after our scene processing. However, there are times where we take photographs, we'll have placards out, we'll have labels out, highlighting particular items. 
but during a search warrant, we're documenting as we're searching. Okay. And so what we see in People's Exhibit uh, 505 here, uh, what was important again for you to document closely here? As you can see along the right hand side of this image, that's the original possible blood stain that was under the, under the carpet. What we're looking at here is an area on the car concrete subfloor under that second possible blood stain that we observed. People's Exhibit 506, uh, we see some measurements here. What are you documenting? This is, this is uh, additional blood, possible blood stains that were on the concrete subfloor under that second pattern we observed. And is the idea behind putting uh, this sort of measurement indicator to give you a sense of uh, scope, some sort of uh, frame of reference? Absolutely. Uh, People's Exhibit 507. Again, this is a photograph of that first area of possible bloodstains, but now a scale is included to show the overall dimensions of, the, of that possible stain. And uh, you're under permission for the witness uh, to publish people's exhibits uh, first 503 uh, and then 504 to the jury by walking past the jury box. Oh, yes, you may go ahead. Uh, Mr. Leeward, if you would go ahead and walk uh, 503 past the jury slowly so that they can review it. This is People's Exhibit 503. And you can see in my left hand is the carpet. In the middle is the carpet padding. And in the right hand is the original packaging that I placed the padding and the carpet into. And based on the way that it's packaged, you're actually able to show the jury the other side of that carpet as well? Correct. This, it's placed in this packaging um, for display purposes. This is not something that the lab itself would do. This is the underside of the carpet padding and the underside of the carpet itself. Now that it's flipped in my right hand is the underside of the carpet. In the middle is the underside of the carpet padding and in my left hand is the underside of my packaging. Thank you, sir. And if you would do the same uh, with People's Exhibit 504 as well. This is People's Exhibit 504. This is that secondary carpet area that I alluded to before. In the left hand, in my left hand is the packaging. In the middle is the upper side of the carpet. And then my right hand is the upper side of the carpet padding. And if you would show the jury the back side of People's Exhibit 504 as well. Same thing now, but in the left hand is the padding. All the underside in the middle is the carpet. In the right hand side, it's the packaging. Thank you. We talked about various abnormalities that you would be interested in documenting. And so, what we see in People's Exhibit 508 um, is there anything that's of note for you and why you photograph this? Yes, I photographed this um, highlighting a chip in what looks like the windowsill. Towards the center of this image, you can see a white windowsill with kind of what appears to be missing paint. This was consistent with being in the area of where the bed originally was. So I thought if an incident did occur there, based on the blue star reaction and the uh, amount of possible blood stains, this may be noteworthy. And what we see in People's Exhibit 509, uh, would this be the close of, of, of that uh, defect that you observed? Correct. I can't determine what that came from. Again, I'm sure we all have nicks like that somewhere in our home, but I thought it would be of interest to photograph just in case. And as you noted, there were various um, reactions along the wall of Gannon Stouk's bedroom. And there was a particular area of a focus that you had um, with regard to an outlet. Can you explain to the jury what you noted there? 
Yes. So in that southeast corner where the bed originally was, there was an outlet cover along the east side of the wall, kind of towards the, the floor trim. Um, with that being said, when we observed the outlet cover, there appeared to be dilute possible blood stains. So we photographed it and uh, collected that item. Your Honor, a permission to approach the witness with what has been marked as People's Exhibit 510, 511, and 512. May go ahead. Mr. Leeward, I handed you People's Exhibits 510 and 511. We'll take those to start. How do you recognize those? These are photographs that I took during the second visit of the outlet cover in that southeast corner of the southeast bedroom. And are they a fair and accurate depiction of what you observed that day? Yes, they are. Your Honor, permission to admit People's Exhibit 510 and 511. No objections. 510, 511 will be admitted. Go ahead. Okay. Permission to publish as well. You may. Uh, so here what we have projected behind you is People's Exhibit 510. Does that depict that outlet you were talking about? Yes, it does. And as you can see, um, I've alluded to the upside down white V in the photo many times. This is, again, that southeast corner of that room. And along the east wall, you have that outlet cover towards the center of this image. Uh, People's Exhibit 511 uh, for scale. What are you noting here? So I put a scale on there to outline the dimensions of the outlet cover. But then when you examine the outlet cover more in depth, for example, along the right hand side of that cover, you can see very faint reddish brown staining consistent with dilute blood stains. So I'm documenting the outlet cover as well as any possible stains on that outlet cover. And Mr. Leeward, can you point to those areas that you're noting specifically for the jury? Absolutely. So um, on the bottom part of this electrical um, outlet, you can see some what appears to be brownish staining under that first, um, the bottom part of that outlet. And then additionally, you can see some, it's faint and difficult to see on this screen, but you can also see what appears to be some flow marks or very dilute marks with linear orientation. And People's Exhibit 512 uh, is, is not a photograph. Uh, do you recognize what that is? I do. What is it? This is the outlet cover, again, based on the label with my initials and my employee number. And there are additional seals on here indicating it's been examined by further forensic personnel. And um, in terms of, again, the method that you use to process, um, would you have swabbed this? Um, what would you have done to this particular area? Again, I would not have swabbed this because I want to make sure the sample is unsaturated as possible. With that being said, we did blue star this corner of the room. We knew there was a reaction in that corner of the room. So I would note that there was a blue star positive reaction from the outlet cover, <clears throat> indicating that there is presumptive blood present. So there's no further swabbing that needed to be necessary, and it would be handed off to the DNA unit. Now, you had mentioned dilute, um, some dilute uh, blood stains there. Um, can you remind the jury what you mean specifically about dilute? Yes. So obviously when you cut your finger, you have very red, thick blood that comes out. And then when you try to clean it up, like if you're in the sink, when you wash it off, it starts to appear runny and starts to become a little bit more clear. That's what I'm alluding to here is that when I say dilute blood stains, that you have very clear, very faint reddish brown staining instead of the very obvious present red color of blood. In terms of the sp you've sprayed this area uh, with Blue Star, um, is there anything that you would have noted um, as it related to the Blue Star re reaction in this area? Is there anything that could have told you or anything that you noticed there? Other than the reaction being blue, indicating that it was presumptive positive for blood, um, there wasn't anything else that I noted outside of the reaction. And so the volume of Blue Star that you spray, um, how would you describe it? Is it a fine mist? Are there large droplets? What is it? It's a very fine mist. So it's a, it's a standard spray bottle that you receive. It's not, like a, it's not like a Febreze spray. It's more of a you 
pump a few times and if you usually will get a reaction after two or three pumps so we try to hold off after using as much as we need to see the reaction and so in terms of you're noting that there's dilute um, blood stain marks what appear to be that uh, on this outlet cover would that have been due to the blue star spray creating that or could that have been done for example by something like cleaning it could be both um, because of the blue star is a liquid that is water-based there will be some dilution, but the amount you're spraying isn't going to dilute it to this level. Okay. And based on what you're seeing with the outlet cover, you're working outside in, what are you gonna do next? I'm gonna take that outlet cover off. I'm gonna collect it. I'm gonna see what's underneath the outlet cover. You're on a permission approach with what's been marked and previously provided to the defense as people's exhibits 500, 513, 515, 516, and 517 as well. Go ahead. You want our permission to approach? You may. Mr. Lieber, I'm handing you people's exhibits 513, 14, 15, 15, and 17. But before I get there, Your Honor, uh, based on uh, the foundation laid by the witness, people have moved for the admission of people's exhibit 500. Defense? No objection. 512 will be admitted. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Lieber, can you take a, uh, sorry, can you take a moment to review that? Absolutely. Now you explained that you um, collected the cover, um, which is feels a bit 512, but you also mentioned that you're going to work outside in. And so um, you're if I haven't already asked uh, permission to publish as well. People's exhibits uh, 513 uh, through 515. Uh, you may go ahead. Thank you. Oh, I, actually, I, I thought did I, you uh, ask to admit those? Uh, I thought I did without objection, but Your Honor, uh, permission to formally admit People's Exhibits 513 through 515 through 517 through 517. I just thought I would take them in uh, kind of different chunks or different items. Mr. Tellini? No, okay. yeah. Exhibits 513 through 517 will be admitted. Great. Um, now, what we have projected behind you is People's Exhibit 513. Um, can you explain what you did now in terms of processing this area? This is a photograph of the electrical outlet itself with the cover removed, highlighting um, what could appear to be on the outlet itself. Uh, People's Exhibit 514. This is a photograph from a different angle, slightly askew and up to the right of the outlet cover because we observed um, so it dilute possible blood stains. And this is a good example of um, that reddish brown color. Instead of a very strong solid red, it appears that there's a clear middle with some of that coloration on the outside. So this would be a good example of um, possible dilute blood. People's exhibit 515. Another photograph just from a slightly different angle. Great. Um, and on the witness stand before you, you have people's exhibit 516. How do you recognize what that is? This, these are the swabs of those possible blood stains on the cover, it's, or, I'm sorry, on the outlet itself because I wasn't going to remove the cover based on possible electrical hazards and it's easier to swab it and take it with us. Um, but I identify it based on my employee number on here and the tape seals on the back with additional tape seals on here indicating it's been tested. And so, for example, do you need to open that envelope to know that those are the swabs that you collected? No. Okay. Uh, for those reasons, uh, while the defense hasn't objected, Your Honor, um, I would ask uh, if uh, People's Exhibit 516 can be admitted as well. No, okay. 516 will be admitted. Go ahead. And, sir, I believe you have People's Exhibit 517 as well. 
how do you recognize what that is? This is a photograph of the room I took after we had removed the outlet cover and um, finished cutting out the carpet from that corner. Okay. And when you uh, exit or finish processing a room, are you also documenting that as well? Yes. I mentioned earlier that when we are taking our photographs of our scene, it's during, uh, it's before, during, and after processing. And we want to document how we left the area after we finished processing as well. So that's this photograph. Great. And again, your honor, I will not object to the, by the defense based on that uh, permission to admit and publish people's exhibit 517. Objection. 517 will be admitted. You can go ahead and publish. Okay. Uh, and so here, uh, this is the last uh, documentation of the work that you did in Gannon Stouck's bedroom? Correct. Based on the overall observations that you observed specifically related to that corner, what was the next step in terms of processing the scene at the Gannon, at Gannon Stouck's residence where he lived? So now that we had observed um, what appeared to be a larger amount of possible blood stains, um, indicating that there was a potential blood shedding event, um, there was going to be, uh, it was going to come down to trying to find what could have caused that. So whether it be a blunt force instrument or a firearm or whatnot, it would have to be trying to narrow down and collecting anything that we could regarding a possible um, in, uh, injuring item. And where were you directed uh, to document and search? During my overalls, I, again, I said I photographed the entirety of the house. There was a firearm, a pistol located in the upstairs master bedroom on a chest of drawers that was of interest now because of the um, possible bloodshedding event. And your honor permission approach the witness with what has been marked as people's exhibits 478 through 483. You may go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Do you recognize those? I'll take a look real fast. Go ahead. Yes, I do. How do you recognize those? These are additional photographs that I took uh, within the master bedroom of the room and of the handgun we observed in um, on the evening of February 3rd. And are they a fair and accurate depiction of what you observed that day? Yes, they are. Uh, Your Honor, at this time we'd move for the admission of People's Exhibit 478 through 483. Defense. 478 through 483 will be admitted. Okay. Can you mute the screen just to be safe? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can unmute it, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lieber, can you explain what we're looking at in People's Exhibit 478? This is a photograph of the master bedroom on the main level of that 6627 Mandan Drive. We've alluded a lot to the southeast bedroom in the basement, um, but referring to the diagram, uh, <laughs> you can see at the top right hand of the main level, when you walk through the laundry room, if you keep walking south, that is the main, that's the um, master bedroom on the main level with the doorway at the northwest corner. All right, and just for the purposes of the record, you're pointing to the diagram on People's Exhibit 442? That's correct. Great. Um, projected behind you, 479. Again, what are you moving forward in the room for? This is another photograph of the room, but now we're standing in the northeast corner facing the southwest corner. People's Exhibit 480. We're facing the chest of drawers that was in the southeast corner of the bedroom. And in the center of the image, you can see a black rectangle. That is the firearm that we collected. People's Exhibit 481. Oh, 
481. This is a uh, mid-range photographs showing the firearm itself now. And 482. This is a close-up of the firearm before I've rendered it safe. Whenever we collect firearms on a scene, we will render it safe. We'll check the chamber for any ammunition and we'll remove the magazine, but we want to photograph it in its condition before we do any of that. So this is that photograph. And uh, again, did you collect this particular firearm? Yes, we collected this firearm. Okay. People's Exhibit 483. What are we looking at here? Where is this taken? So now we have, now I've placed this on an envelope uh, to show, um, to have a, a cleaner area to take the photograph. But as you can see now, the slide is locked back. There is no um, round or cartridge in the chamber. And there's a scale above the gun indicate, helping indicate size. Now you had indicated that based on what appeared to be some sort of bloodletting event that occurred in Gannon Stout's bedroom, um, is this what allowed you to then seize and take this particular firearm? Yes. You're on a permission approach with what's been marked as People's Exhibit 484 and 485. You may go ahead. Yes, I recognize these. How do you recognize those? So the box that I was holding that contains the firearm that we collected here, um, I recognize that on the with the label and my employee number as well as the tape seals. And then the envelope that I was holding, which is People's Exhibit 485, that is the magazine from within the firearm containing approximately 16 cartridges. Uh, now, at this time, um, can you, I'll direct your attention to People's Exhibit 484. Uh, what can you tell based on the markings on that box? Um, I can tell um, that it's been processed for fingerprints as well as DNA um, sampling, and that it appears that there have been additional exams done by the firearms unit as well as the DNA unit. Okay. Um, and at this time, uh, would you use the scissors that are next to you to uh, open that box? Absolutely. And to be clear, while you're doing that, uh, when you uh, receive a firearm and you take it into evidence, uh, what have you done specifically with this uh, particular firearm that we see photographed in People's Exhibit 583? So when we collect a firearm, when I say render it safe, what that means is I will lock the slide back um, that will disengage the firearm. And when that occurs, a chambered round, if there is a round within the chamber, that will also be expelled. So now there's no cartridge in the chamber that can be fired. And I will also remove the magazine, meaning that there is no ammunition in the gun and that is not able to be fired with the slide lock backed. And when you checked the chamber of this particular firearm, uh, was, there, uh, was there a round in the chamber? There was no round in the chamber. Okay. Um, do you recognize after you've opened the box, uh, People's Exhibit 584 um, before you? May I handle it to observe the serial number? Uh, Your Honor, uh, just to confirm uh, that particular item has, again, has it still been in the state that it's been rendered safe? Yes, it is safe. Uh, Your Honor, permission for the witness to further inspect? Sorry. Got to put some gloves on. I'm just pointing it in a safe direction. <laughs> uh, and Mr. Lewer, uh, why are you taking a moment to uh, look at the, the firearm more closely? I'm sorry, what was that? Why are you taking a moment to look at the firearm more closely? Is that to ensure that is in fact uh, no chamber in the round, et cetera? Correct, I'm ensuring that there is no chamber in the round, that it is a safe firearm, and that it has the same serial number as what is labeled on the label. I guess I should say round in the chamber. Correct. <laughs>
So I remember with this firearm, there is a particular grip cover that is covering the serial number. So um, to preserve the evidence, I'm not going to remove that cover, but it is consistent with the firearm that I observe here, especially with that grip cover being there, it's giving me a friendly reminder. Okay. And would you say that's in substantially the same uh, condition as when you last handled it and uh, booked it into evidence? I would. There is a yellow discoloration on it now, which is indicative of something we do when we fingerprint process our items of evidence. But other than that, it is in the same condition. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, uh, permission uh, to admit People's Exhibit uh, 404 uh, at this time. 484? 484. Okay. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Defense? As long as 484. It's 484. Okay. 484 will be admitted. Go ahead. All right. And Your Honor, uh, permission to publish to the jury um, by the witness walking past the jury box. You may. Go ahead. So as I'm walking by, for you guys to take a look at that discoloration I alluded to before. Um, as you can see in the photograph, the, the firearm is black, but now there's this greenish, white, yellow hue on it. That is a process that we do when we fingerprint process, and that's why there's this discoloration. But again, there's also no magazine here, and there's no chambered round. That's some, I would have collected the magazine separately from the firearm. Thank you. And now for People's Exhibit 485, how do you recognize that exhibit? This People's Exhibit 485 is the magazine that was collected from the firearm itself. And it's in an envelope. Um, do you need to open up that envelope to be sure that that's the magazine uh, that you collected? I do not. There are additional labels and seals from individuals within our lab, which would have it be in substantial condition as it was collected. And, Your Honor, at this time, we'd move for the admission of People's Exhibit 485. No objection. 485 will also be admitted. Go ahead. Thank you. And now, Mr. Leeward, you explained what you noticed about the magazine and the cartridges. Can you remind uh, the jury what you observed with regard to how many cartridges the magazine appeared to have a capacity for and how many cartridges you observed as an approximation? Yes. So whenever we have a magazine for a firearm, there's usually an indicator on the magazine saying how many it can be loaded with. That number may not always be true, whereas sometimes someone can force an additional cartridge in. So for the purposes of this magazine, I put an approximately 17 round capacity magazine. And on this magazine, there were window spots where you could see the cartridges and I could count 16, but sometimes that number is deceiving because one could be hidden in there. So I put there approximately 16 cartridges within. So in total, it's an approximately 17 round capacity magazine with approximately 16 cartridges within. And um, specifically, again, that magazine was found uh, in relation to the firearm uh, with the firearm. Correct. It was within the firearm when I collected it and I removed it and collected it separately. And is that pursuant to the policy that you have with the Metro Crime Lab? Yes. With our policy, we cannot load, we cannot put loaded firearms into evidence. So we will always remove the magazine. And additionally, when we have magazines with ammunition in them, we do not want to remove the ammunition from within because it may destroy fingerprints and any DNA evidence. So instead of pulling out the cartridges and counting them, it, I believed it would be most probative to preserve the fingerprints and DNA if present. And based on how you make that uh, item of evidence, that firearm specifically available, is it now available to other members of the Metro Crime Lab for additional processing? Yes. Testing? Correct, yes. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, permits to approach the witness with what has been marked as Pupils Exhibit 518 through... 527. You may. Go ahead. Mr. Lewer, I'll first take uh, 518 and 519 separately. Uh, do you recognize each of those?
Yes, I do. How do you recognize them? People's Exhibit 518 are the swabs of the Blue Star Presumptive Positive Reactions. I observed um, in the stairwell between the main bedroom, the main level and the basement. And then People's Exhibit 519 are the Presumptive Positive Blue Star Reactions within the basement level of the residence, which would include the storage room and the southeast bedroom at the base of the stairs. And so you saw a number of photos uh, in the basement level uh, of the residence, um, some in nearby Gannon's room and nearby those stair areas. Those swabs generally taken from those areas? That is correct, yes. And just to be clear, can you also point out on People's Exhibit 442 uh, for the jury where those swabs come from? Absolutely. So I mentioned the camera malfunction before. So again, what was most important was collecting those samples and noting it. A, one way to diagram where those came from is to include them in my diagram here. So on the main level or the top part of the diagram here, um, we're focusing now on the green dots. The green dots in my diagram represent blue star reactions on my second visit or the evening of February 3rd. So as you can see here, we have one on the first stair set going downward. We have one that looks like it's outside of the stairwell. That was an error on my part. That one was within the first landing of the stairwell. I placed that incorrectly. That is my fault. Um, we have uh, a blue star reaction on the second landing, the second set of stairs going downward. And then um, on the bottom half of this diagram, now that we're in the basement level, we have one right at the base of the stairs, um, the floor right in front of the storage room in Gannon's bedroom, and then we have a green dot within the storage room and within the southeast corner of his bedroom. So essentially, we have blue star reactions along the stairwell and then at the storage room in his room as well. And what would have been the path of travel um, if you traveled, someone were to travel from the basement area to Gannon's room? Can you point out on People's Exhibit 442, what that path of travel would have been. Actually, the most direct path of travel uh, between Gannon's room um, <clears throat> to go upstairs into the garage would be out his room, up the stairwell, and then directly to the garage. And as you can see here, we have blue star reactions in that general pathway. Thank you. Uh, I've also handed you um, People's Exhibit 520 through 527, um, those are different, right? These are different. Okay, what are those? I responded to the address on February 5th for another search, and these are photographs that were taken during that search. Okay, and are those also fair and accurate representations of what you saw on February 5th of 2020? Yes, they are. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, we've moved for the admission of People's Exhibit 518 through 527. Exhibits 518 through 527 will be admitted. Go ahead. And Your Honor, permission to publish People's Exhibits 520 through 527. You may. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Lee, we're behind you is going to be People's Exhibit 520. Can you point out to the jury what you've documented here? Yes. So there isn't a mid-range photograph showing what this is, but at the bottom of the screen, you can see the red washer and dryer we've mentioned before. So what we're looking at here is the top of that washer and dryer in the laundry room. And what's of interest, or what was of interest for us in this photograph, was a bottle of vinegar on top of one of those appliances. And based on seeing, again, the bloodletting event, um, or at least what had occurred, uh, the remnants of something in Gannon Stouck's bedroom. Uh, what was the specific scope of what you were looking for on February 5th of 2020 now? We wanted to document and search for any cleaning products because now that we had a bloodshedding event with, di with dilute possible blood stains, there was evidence that there may have been possible cleanup. So we wanted to search for any possible cleaning materials that would have been used in that action. Okay. Uh, People's Exhibit 521, what is this a close-up of? This is a close-up of um, a bottle of distilled vinegar from uh, top of one of those appliances. A People's Exhibit 522, where are we at? Can you orient the jury now what we see and what room we're in? 
Yes, now we are in the kitchen, which is on the main level of the, um, of the, of the home. And now we are looking under the sink because we wanted to pull out any cleaning supplies that would have been for carpet or upholstery, not specifically for any dishes. Um, but this is a photograph of the under sink doors open with some products pulled out. Uh, People's Exhibit 523. Um, what are you close up documenting here? This is just a close up photograph of the contents that have not been pulled out from under the sink. People's Exhibit 524, uh, what are you documenting here? This is a zoomed in photograph of smoke and uh, odor eliminator, uh, a bottle of it under the sink. And in People's Exhibit 525, what are some other cleaning products that you notice below the cabinet? Again, this is the other side of that sink cabinet now. Or there's a box of um, Arm & Hammer cleaner um, under the sink, or baking soda, I believe. Uh, People's Exhibit 526, is that a close-up of that box you were referring to? Baking soda. Uh, People's Exhibit 527, uh, is this the overall shot of the various substances that you found under the kitchen sink in that cabinet area? Correct. This is with some of the contents pulled out. Okay. And you can take a seat. You've walked us through um, at least three instances that you were present to document in the residence at 6627 Mandan Drive. Um, those three dates were um, two dates with three instances that you searched. What, what again? February 3rd, um, around 11 o'clock. February 3rd, around 6 p.m. And then February 5th, closer to the lunch hour as well. And while you were present on scene, was there any obvious signs of blood or a struggle that you observed on any of those times? So when we responded on February 5th, it was much more lit in, the, in Gannon's bedroom. And we had many individuals focusing on the walls. And we observed very, very tiny non-diluted blood stains or possible blood stains. So we called in um, one of our crime scene investigators to help document those blood stains. And another member of the Metro Crime Lab team would have done an in-depth review of those smaller, very clear um, blood stains. Correct. They would have done a documentation of those stains, which would have allowed them to do any blood stain pattern analysis going forward. That's not your area of expertise, right? That's not my area of expertise. To be clear, uh, the two times that you were present on February 2nd of 2020, in February 5th of 2020, at any point, did you see any shell casings? I did not see any cartridge casings during any of my visits. Aside from the gun, did you see any other items such as a knife um, that would have been misplaced or in another area of the house? I did not see any knives in any odd places in the house. Okay. In terms of um, documenting what you saw and observed in Gannon Stouk's bedroom or other areas of the house, such as the master bedroom, uh, was there any obvious signs of bloodstained clothing? No, I did not see any bloodstained clothing. Um, I did collect a sheet with uh, apparent blood or possible bloodstains on it from the additional uh, bedroom in the basement. Um, it, I was informed it belonged to the teenage daughters. Ms. Gratiano, do you have a response? Your Honor, uh, he's just testified that he's collected it, uh, but also uh, in his practice as a CSI, um, he's relying on information from other members of law enforcement in the collection of evidence. And without further foundation, I'll sustain the objection. Specific to that particular item, um, were you given um, some additional um, information in terms of uh, other members of law enforcement, either a supervisor, um, that that had evidentiary value? Potential evidentiary value? Yes. Okay. And in your role as a CSI um, in the collection of evidence, um, are you relying on information and or briefings um, that other members are provided to, providing to you to collect evidence? Correct. There is a level of requiring information from individuals so we can place the scene. For example, if I did not know the Southeast bedroom was Gannon's bedroom, um, we would have 
search started searching in other places. So when we are provided information, it's to help scope down our search and which can also help with um, identifying items of evidence. Okay. And so based on a briefing that you had received, did that particular item become of evidentiary interest in the investigation? It did with there being possible blood stains on it. Thank you. Your Honor, we'll pass the witness. Cross-examination. Hey, sir, how are you doing? I'm doing great today. How are you? I'm not doing too bad. So let's go to that, what we were just talking about. That Was it a sheet or a comforter? It was a comforter on the bed that I collected, and I collected an additional sheet from the closet of that room that had a blue star reaction. And that's an... That's I, an I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and that's from... It's from that, the Northwest bedroom. Correct. That's the basement Northwest bedroom. And based upon everybody that was there and also based upon what was in that bedroom as far as color schemes, clothing, so forth, that appeared to be the bedroom of a teenage girl. Correct. Uh, you're aware that Miss Stalk has a 17-year-old teenage girl by the name of Harley Hunt? I did not know the name, but I knew that a teenage uh, female resided in the home. And there was actually a... There was a blood stain on that mattress, and that mattress was collected? We did not collect the mattress, but we collected the comforter because the comforter was um, superimposed on the mattress. You could say that the possible blood stains were transferred apart so, or transferred onto the mattress. So we collected the comforter in lieu of the mattress. Okay, because it looked like there would have been the, whatever that blood stain was, it would have been the same source of blood, both for the comforter and both for the mattress, it in, appeared, your, in your opinion. It appeared consistent with that, yes. And so. You don't necessarily have to collect the mattress. You can just collect the comforter, and that will be enough to tell you whose blood that was. Correct. And then there was also stuffed in the laundry basket of that same teenage girl's room, a sheet. Correct. That sheet looked like it had blood on it? It had a blue star reaction um, that we documented. Okay, and a blue star reaction would indicate that there may be blood on that sheet. Correct. It would indicate that there is possibly blood um, present on that sheet. So in the teenage girl's bedroom on that February 5th search, you found two items that appear to have blood on them, correct? Correct. No further questions. Be direct. No, Your Honor, no. Do any of the jurors have any questions for uh, Mr. LeBoer? All right, looks like we have one. One, all right, counsel approach, please. Mr. Lewer, if a uh, blue star is a presumptive test for blood, how is testing accomplished to separate blue star from an actual blood sample? So blue star is reacting with the heme component of the blood, whereas when we have a DNA sample, they're looking for um, DNA within different components of the blood. So the blue star itself is not overriding the DNA because the DNA component is still present in the sample. That may have answered this question, but I'll ask it. Um, does blue star impact or affect the actual blood sample? What would impact the sample is how much we're spraying or diluting the sample, but blue star does not negatively affect DNA processing further on down the line. All right. I will allow reasonable follow-up as to that question or those questions only. Prosecution. Nothing further, Your Honor. Fence. Nothing, Your Honor. 
Thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you all. Prosecution, call your next witness, please. Judge, um, our next witness is an expert, and we need to gather some exhibits together. And I'm wondering if we could just give the jury about a 10-minute break to do that. Yeah, that's fine. Um, or if you want to do the afternoon break, too. No, we'll, we'll, um, we'll probably do two of them because it's a little bit early. So um, what we're going to do is take about a 10-minute recess. Again, you may not discuss the case among yourselves, may not discuss the case with anyone else. Um, with that, all rise for the jury, please. Thank you. May all be seated. The record should reflect the jury has left the courtroom. Who is the next one? Um, Stephanie Hap. My thought would be that we go with her until like four o'clock, then take about another 10 minute recess or so, something like that. Otherwise, they're going to be sitting there for like two and a half hours. So. Yes. Okay. All right.
All right, court will recall 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury's not present in the courtroom. Are we good to go? We are, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you have everything you need? Yep, you all on the table in front of the witness stand there. Perfect. Okay. All right, let's go ahead. Uh, is there anything we need to bring up outside the presence of the jury at this point in time? Prosecution? Not from us, Judge. Defense? No, sir. All right, let's go ahead and do it. Oh, that's a good way to do that. Somebody was smart. Either that or it did it on its own. So, well, no, I think so, because the clips, I pull the clips up the holes. But... And it usually tips the other way because the paper on it. Yeah. So, I'm going to do this. They don't work. If they stay up. If, if they stay up. Did you remember the poor guy that almost got hit in the chin? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or three photos, I should say. <clears throat> All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. May all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Prosecution, call next witness, please. Thank you, Your Honor. We will call Stephanie Hepp. Ms. Hepp, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, ma'am. <laughs> You swear for the testimony about giving this man will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing about the truth. Go ahead and have a seat in the witness stand. Please watch your step as you step into the stand. Mr. Allen? Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ma'am. How are you? Good afternoon. Good. And you? Good. Thank you. Will you please introduce yourself to our jury and then spell your first and last name for our court reporter? Yes. My name is Stephanie Happ, H A P P S T E F. A N I E. I am the senior firearms examiner with the Colorado Springs Metro Crime Lab. So, what education do you have that uh, allows you to do that job? My education consists of a bachelor's of science in chemistry with an emphasis in criminalistics. I received that from the Metropolitan State College of Denver. During my degree program, I was required to complete an internship, and I did so with the Jefferson County uh, Sheriff's Department's Crime Lab for a period of about two years. While I was with them, I had the opportunity to work in all the different areas of their laboratory, so I got a good understanding of a variety of different forensic analyses. I had training in latent print processing and examination, crime scene investigation, controlled substance analysis, and question document analysis. After my time with them, I spent a short period of time with the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and then I was hired in my current capacity in October of 27, 2007. Um, as a firearms examiner, and that's where my firearms training began. That first year was very much like an apprenticeship where I simply shadowed the senior examiner so that I could get an understanding of the types of things I would be asked to do. After approximately a year, I was accepted to the California Criminalistics Institute, where I completed an additional year of intensive study in all the different types of firearms related analyses. I had training in serial number restoration, shooting incident reconstruction, a variety of armorers courses that were designed to teach me how to identify how different types of firearms should work and how to identify abnormalities if there were any present. I spent a large period of time focusing on the microscopic tool mark comparison process as it relates to firearms as well as other types of tools. Um, at the conclusion of that year's period, I returned to the crime lab and I completed a series of competency and proficiency tests and became established as the primary examiner for the lab. To date, I've had over a thousand hours of training with respect to all those different types of firearms related analyses and thousands of additional hours of research and study in the lab. Thank you so much for covering all that. Easiest question I've ever asked. <clears throat> Have you been qualified as an expert witness? I have. How many times? 
to date, it's been 145 in both local and federal courts. So when you say local, do you mean the 4th Judicial District here? I do, as well as the 18th. So up in Arapahoe, Douglas County areas? Douglas, yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, Your Honor, based on her um, excellent answer on her qualifications, I would move to have her qualified as an expert witness as a firearms examiner. Defense? No objection. The witness will be so qualified. Go ahead. So let's get some um, groundwork stuff out of the way just so that we're all talking the same language. You mentioned tool marks. Tell the jury what we mean when we talk about tool marks as it relates to firearms. Tool marks as it relates to firearms. In, in this particular instance, we would be talking about the firearm acting as the tool. And that firearm has a series of components, like the barrel, for example, that impart different markings on the surfaces of the fired ammunition components, like the cartridge cases and bullets. So the tool marks are produced by the firearm on the surface of the bullets and cartridge cases. <clears throat> and then when we're talking up about a cartridge or a bullet, talk, tell the jury what we are talking about there. I'd be happy to. Would it be all right to use the demonstrative piece? Yes, did you bring your demonstrative? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, go ahead and bring that. It's just a demonstrative of a bullet component. Right. So this is just a large plastic demonstrative piece. It de de depicts, rather, a cartridge of ammunition in its unfired state. When a cartridge of ammunition is fired, the firing pin component of the firearm contacts the silver portion right here, the primer. The primer contains a shock sensitive material that when it's struck ignites a powder charge that's located inside the body of the cartridge. As that powder charge burns, there's a very rapid buildup of gases and it's those gases that are responsible for forcing the bullet down the barrel of the firearm and almost simultaneously forcing the action of the firearm open so that the cartridge case or the empty piece after it's been fired can be extracted and ejected or kicked out of the chamber of the firearm, readying the firearm to be loaded the next time. So the cartridge ends up in two pieces. We have a bullet or a projectile. Sometimes fragments or pieces of the bullet and projectile are recovered. And then we have the cartridge case. In the way that you're describing the, using that particular demonstrative, is that for a semi-automatic uh, firearm? Uh, that general description would cover most firearms, but it semi-automatic would fit in that. And then as far as handguns go, um, tell the jury the difference between a revolver and a semi-automatic. So with a semi-automatic handgun, and to be clear when we're speaking in those terms, semi-automatic means one cartridge of ammunition is fired for each pull of the trigger. With a semi-automatic firearm, the primary difference other than the way it looks, but in terms of its function, is the cartridge case is extracted and ejected and often found left behind. With respect to a revolver, the cartridges of ammunition are loaded into a cylinder, and those fired cartridge cases remain in that cylinder until the operator chooses to manually remove them. Um, as it relates to um, this particular case, did you have a chance to review items that were recovered from autopsy? I did. Uh, Your Honor, may I approach? You may. I'm going to start out by showing you People's 89 that was previously admitted by Cody Smith, a crime scene technician from Florida. Um, did you have a chance to look at those uh, that item? I did not evaluate this specific item. Okay. The those little plastic red tips, do you recognize what those are? They appear to be consistent with the polymer plugs that are incorporated into various hollow point designs of bullets. Did you send over some pictures to give us an example so that the jury understands what we're talking about, the polymer plugs? I did. And you know, at this time I'd ask for permission to publish two demonstrative photos of Hornady rounds of ammunition that show that polymer plug. Uh, has the defense seen these? Yes, they have. And uh, is there an objection? No. All right. Go ahead. We're pulling them up now. So this is the, the first, um, just please describe what we're talking about there. Sure. This is an actual live cartridge of Hornaday ammunition. You'll see the projectile or the bullet is the copper colored portion sticking out at this side here. The cartridge case is the silver or nickel colored portion on this side here. You can see in this profile picture, the nose of the bullet located right here has a material that's placed inside. 
This particular type of bullet is referred to as a hollow point bullet. It's a bullet designed to expand when it comes into contact with tissue. That expansion is to facilitate staying within the target at the time it enters. It's also to facilitate a larger wound track. Does that mean basically that the, the bullet head is the way I'll say it um, expands so that it has more friction? It, it opens up, looks very much like a mushroom. It's actually called mushroom. So the top of that opens up like flower petals and it increases the diameter of that projectile. Okay. And if we could pull up the next demonstrative. Tell the jury what we're looking at there. This is a photo looking down at that same cartridge. So now instead of looking at it like this, you're looking at it from this way. And it's just capturing an example of what that polymer plug that some ammunition companies utilize. That polymer plug is designed to prevent that hollow point cavity from filling up with other materials, preventing the expansion of that bullet comes when it comes into contact with tissue. And then the item that I put on the, uh, that I just handed you people's exhibit 89, those um, plastic red tips, is that consistent with what we're looking at in this demonstrative exhibit that would prevent the round from being plugged as it's fired through something? Yes, they do appear to be consistent with that. Okay. I'm going to retrieve that. With your um, job as a, a firearms examiner, were you asked to examine some firearms in this particular case? I was. What exactly were you asked to examine for your for this case? I was asked to look at three different firearms, complete mechanical functioning examinations on those firearms. So an examination to determine whether or not they work and whether or not they work the way the manufacturer intended. And then to evaluate those firearms for comparison to recovered bullets. So um, tell the jury which types of firearms you were asked to examine. The first firearm that I um, have listed was a FMK model nine. C1 G2 nine millimeter pistol. The second firearm, and this is really in no particular order. Um, the second firearm was a Smith and Wesson M and P bodyguard caliber 380 auto pistol. And the third pistol was a Smith and Wesson M and P nine C nine millimeter Luger pistol. So when we're talking about those three different firearms are two of those nine millimeter and then one is a 380 caliber. That's correct. Tell the jury the difference between nine millimeter and 380. The primary difference is going to be the, the, the size of the cartridge that those fire. Um, the 380 auto is going to be a lower velocity, smaller cartridge. Okay. <clears throat> and then as it relates to, um, I just put the box and uh, an envelope up there, people's 484 and 45 that were just admitted through um, I'm seeing investigator Christian Luer. Uh, did you have a chance to look at those items? Yes, I did. Is that the same as what you just described as the Smith & Wesson m and I'm sorry, not the Smith & Wesson m and the Smith & Wesson model m and 9C 9mm? Yes, it is. Um, is that one of the, so that's one of the weapons that you tested? It is. What did you determine as it relates to whether that was a functioning firearm? I was able to determine that this was an operable firearm capable of causing serious injury or death, and I did not note any abnormalities in its function. Okay. So when you um, test that, do you actually test fire that weapon? Yes, I do. Or may I approach with people 713? Me. You recognize 713? Yes, I do. How do you recognize it? I recognize it from the label that I created when I created these items, as well as my dates and initials on the seal. Is it in the same or substantially the same condition today as um, when you package this up? It is. And I move for admission of people 713. Defense. Yes, Exhibit 713 will be admitted. Go ahead. So when you do a test fire, um, what do you do? How, how do you do that um, to compare maybe rounds or projectiles that are found in an investigation to what you're test firing? Once I have documented all of the identifying characteristics of the firearm, like the make, the model, the serial number, and the caliber of ammunition it's designed to fire, the final step in confirming function is to load that with the appropriate caliber ammunition and actually fire it. Okay. And then 
Once you have an expelled round from your test fires, what do you do with that expelled round? I recover those cartridge cases and the bullets. The bullets are fired into a giant steel tank full of water. Um, that water serves to slow those bullets down gently and without imparting any additional markings or details on the surface of those bullets. So when I recover them from the water and I look at them, I know that any marks produced on the surface of those bullets are solely produced from the barrel of the firearm that I just fired them through. I recover those bullets from the water tank as well as the cartridge cases, and those now become an item of evidence in the case. And is that what we have in 713? It is. It is both the test-fired bullets, the test-fired cartridge cases, and a silicone cast of this barrel. So tell us about a silicone cast of the barrel. What does that mean? The barrel of firearms, when we do comparison and evaluation, um, has to be looked at for the types of markings that are present inside the barrel, the types of tool markings that were produced when it was manufactured. It's those different markings inside the barrel that are then transferred to the surfaces of the bullet when it's pushed through the barrel of the firearm, and it forms more or less a signature of a particular firearm. I cast the barrel of these firearms after I complete my test firing so that I can evaluate those markings and determine if they're going to be suitable for comparison and identification purposes. Does this process allow you to potentially compare a uh, projectile that kills somebody? to your test fire to see if the, if the gun that you test fired is the same gun that was used to kill the person? It certainly could be done for that purpose. It's also very often done for the purpose of eliminating a gun as a possibility. So let's talk about eliminating. Um, you mentioned those other two firearms that you tested, that 380 caliber handgun, the Smith & Wesson bodyguard, and then the FMK Model 9C1G2. Um, did you test, those, test fire those weapons? I did. Were they functional weapons? Excuse me. Yes, they did operate as they were intended. And were those capable of causing serious bodily injury or death? They were. Did you test um, or compare the, the test fired rounds from those two guns to uh, projectiles that were recovered in this investigation? I did perform that evaluation. Were you able to determine whether those were used to fire the, those projectiles or did you eliminate those weapons from being used in this case? I was able to eliminate both of those firearms as potential sources of those bullets. Okay, I'm going to approach and show you people's exhibits 103 and 88. I want to start with uh, people's number 103, which was previously admitted by crime scene technician Kelly Smith from Florida, uh, two projectiles that were recovered from a pillow. Okay. Um, had you had a chance to look at those two items? I did. Were you able to compare your test fire rounds from this uh, particular firearm sitting up there with you today to those particular um, projectiles? I was. What does that analysis tell us? In this particular instance, I was able to conclude that one of the bullets in People's Exhibit 103 was fired in the Smith & Wesson um, pistol, 9mm pistol, People's Exhibit 484. The other bullet had similar general characteristics, but due to the damaged condition of that particular bullet, I was not able to make a conclusive identification in that instance. So let's talk about that just a little bit. If a, like you described there, that it uh, damage. What can cause damage to a projectile that would make it difficult for you to, to conclude that it came from the same weapon? The first issue to contend with is any of the um, target surfaces that that bullet travels through. So anything it travels through has the ability to impart additional damage to the surfaces that may obliterate the markings that were left behind by the firearm. In this particular instance, the extended period of exposure to biological substances also left significant damage in the form of corrosion, if you will, on the surfaces of these bullets. And in this case, the first projectile that I discussed, I was able to clean up well enough to be able to still visualize the tool marks from the barrel. Um, in the second circumstance, it just simply was no longer in suitable condition. Okay, and then when we talk about People's Exhibit 88, uh, which was previously admitted again by crime scene technician Kelly Smith uh, from Florida, projectile recovered at autopsy. Did you have a chance to look at that item? I did. What did your analysis of that item tell you? I was able to conclude that that bullet was also fired in the Smith & Wesson pistol, People's Exhibit 484. 
meaning that the pistol that's in the box in front of you uh, was fired and uh, struck Gannon and was recovered in Gannon's autopsy. That bullet was fired through that pistol, yes. Okay. Um, we also have some photographs. Uh, Out before you got on the stand with the photos. <laughs> I can assist you. Pat, are you looking for any of these up here? <clears throat> Mr. Allen? Yes, sir. Are you looking for that stack there? Oh. Okay. No, those are previously submitted. Mm -hmm. All right. Approaching you with people's exhibits 680, 681, and 682. Recognize those photos? Yes, I do. How do you recognize them? These are photographs that I took using the comparison microscope when I was making the comparisons of the evidence bullets to the test fired bullets from the Smith and Wesson pistol. Well, these. Um Exhibits help explain the way that you do your examination of your test fired rounds to the known rounds or the re rounds recovered in this case. They do. Are they fair and accurate representations as to what you saw when you performed your analysis? Yes, they are. I move for admission of People's Exhibit 680, 681, and 682. Uh, Mr. Cook. Objection. Exhibit 680, 81, and 82 will be admitted. Go ahead. In permission to publish? You may. I think you just turned the screen off, Judge. I did. Okay. Let me know when you're there. I didn't want to have anything else appear. So you've got presenter mode. So you can just slide that back over to our side. <clears throat> it's yeah. We'll just work through this. So we've got six. Go back, please. There we go. So this, the main picture in the center of the screen, my eyes are getting bad, so I can't read the exhibit number when it's smaller like that. Does that say 680? Yes, it does. Okay. So tell the jury what we're looking at in People's Exhibit 680. So People's Exhibit 680 is a photograph of one of the bullets that I received for comparison purpose. This at to me at the time it was known as item 727. This photograph is taken um, using a camera that's a, hooked up to the comparison microscope. The comparison microscope is simply a large scope that has one set of eyepieces to look through and two stages. So when I mount items on those stages and look through the eyepieces, I can see both of those items simultaneously side by side. 
and I can increase the magnification at varying levels as I work through the analysis to look at those different tool marks that are present. In this instance, what you're looking at here is the hollow point bullet expanded. So when we talked about the mushrooming effect, that's what you see here. This is the nose that opened up, and this is the base of the bullet here. And in this photograph, it's just documenting the overall condition of the projectile, as well as one of the land impressions that I evaluated. What is, just so we understand it, what's that opaque um, blob in the front of the bullet? This material right here is just a sticky wax substance that I use to hold the bullet in place so that I can turn it and rotate it on the microscope as I work through all the different surfaces. In this particular Exhibit 680, can you point out some of the tool marks that we talked about earlier on this particular item? I can. So in this particular area right here, this thing that looks like tracks right in the center, that's what's known as a land impression. The area above it right here and the area below it right here is what's known as a groove impression. Those are lands and grooves are high spots and low spots that are formed into the barrel of a firearm. Um, they're formed in a particular number and with a twist to either direct the bullet to spin to the right or spin to the left when it's fired. The, purposes of rif the purpose of rifling is for spin stabilization. It allows that bullet to travel in the straightest possible distance for the longest amount of time accurately. It's very much like throwing a spiral football down a field as opposed to just lobbing it out there. Those markings are impressed then onto the surface of this bullet as it passes down the barrel of the firearm. Okay, and then if we can move on to 681. What are we looking at in 681? 681 depicts only one photograph of many that were taken during the comparison process. And what you see here is item that was known to me as item 727, so one of the evidence bullets. There's a black line that runs down the center here separating the two images. And on the left-hand side is a portion of the test-fired bullet that I generated using the Smith & Wesson pistol, People's Exhibit 484. And what I'm capturing in this photograph is the overall size dimension correspondence as well as an area of detail that I'm interested in right in through here. And then there was some additional detail in through here. When you say um, the item that you understood as number 727, what specifically um, for your purposes is item 727? <clears throat> 727 was the bullet that was recovered from the victim at autopsy. Okay, thank you. And then if we can go on to um, 682. Tell the jury what we're looking at in 682. People's Exhibit 682 is essentially the exact same photograph that you just saw previously. Test fire on the left, evidence bullet on the right, only now it's a much higher magnification of this area of the projectile here. And I'm looking at these lines that run through the center line um, and correspond to one another. As I work through my comparison, I look at all of those different surfaces of the bullet, either observing the agreement or disagreement that's present so that I can render my conclusion. Was there agreement or disagreement um, in these two images? In these two images, there was agreement not only here, but additional agreement that was captured up here and in other areas. As you evaluate those photographs for yourself, keep in mind that this photograph is taken of a curved surface and the camera sits right above the curved surface. So there's only a small area that's in focus when I'm completing this evaluation. Um, so the stuff that you see that starts to phase out of focus is not necessarily in misalignment. It's simply not the area being fo focused on for the photograph. Again, does this photo um, show that uh, the item recovered from autopsy came from the same gun? This is one of many photos taken that depict that, yes. Okay. Um, you can go ahead and take the, the photos down now. What I would like to have you do at this point is um, using people's exhibit number 484, if you could just open that up and show the jury. Um, when this particular type of firearm is fired, uh, just explain the mechanism and what happens with a shell casing. So I'll first point out that People's Exhibit 40 is secured not only into the box, but it has a gun lock running through the action of the firearm. So in its current state, I can see the chamber is open, there's no ammunition present, and it is completely safe. It could not be fired in this condition. So what you're looking at is a pistol that is not um, fully open or closed. When this firearm is 
loaded for use. The magazine is inserted into the grip located right here. It's the piece that the lock is running through. The slide, which is this top portion up here, is pulled to the rearward position and allowed to move forward again. And when that occurs, the slide pushes a cartridge of ammunition from the top of the magazine into the chamber of the firearm or this rearmost portion of the barrel. That action also cocks this firearm and it's readied for firing. To actuate firing, the operator would pull the trigger of the firearm and that would send the firing pin into the primer component, so sorry, into the primer component of the cartridge and detonate that primer component so that firing can occur. The bullet will travel down the barrel of the firearm and the action or the slide will be forced rearward so that that cartridge case can be extracted and ejected and the next round can be placed in the chamber of the pistol. So when that um, particular type of firearm is fired, it kicks the shell casing out like in your uh, demonstrative exhibit of your bullet? It does if it's operating properly and if nothing is impeding movement of that slide. When, when a shell casing is kicked out of a firearm like that, do they pile up in a nice, neat little pile? Not necessarily. Um, it very much depends on what surfaces those cartridge cases may hit as they exit the firearm. For example, if you're in a room and there's furniture or walls or ceilings present, those cartridge cases may hit those surfaces and they can bounce all over the place. Conversely, if you're outdoors and you're standing on a nice fluffy bed of grass, as that cartridge case exits the firearm and lands in the grass, it may rest where it lays. So its terminal point may be very consistent. Is there any such thing as a uh, disintegrating shell casing? <laughs> Meaning that if a firearm is fired like this, that a shell casing doesn't come out or just disappears? I'm not aware of one just disappearing. I'm aware of them perhaps not coming out of the firearm, but not disappearing. Okay. So um, that's all I have. Thank you. Cross-examination. Good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm well. Thank you. Um, so if can you look at the exhibit with the pistol in the cardboard box again? I'm that. Uh, are firearms or handguns, semi-automatic handguns, are they like a shotgun that's a semi-automatic where they're left-handed and right-handed shotguns? Are there left-handed and right-handed pistols? Are we speaking in terms of the direction it ejects? Yes. Yes, yes there are. Uh, examining that one there, would that be some a pistol that is shot by a left-handed or a right-handed person? I should say that it could be it could be fired by either a left-handed or a right-handed person, um, but I will state that it ejects the cartridge case if it's being held in its conventional proper manner. It ejects the cartridge case to the right. Okay. So more than likely, this would be a pistol that was shot by somebody that was right-handed. Cartridge goes off, is ejected to the right, so it's not going across the shooter's field of vision. I would object as to speculation. Um, he's asking to speculate as to the handedness of the uh, shooter. Well, uh, I will allow him to rephrase the question because at one point he was talking about if it's in your left hand, it's going to the shell is going to be ejected over your field of vision. Um, so I will allow that. Why? What do you base your uh, opinion on as far as that's a left or right handed pistol? So I would not refer to it as either a left or right handed pistol. I would simply address it in terms of what direction it ejects the cartridge case and handedness as far as shooters go is one element to consider with respect to whether or not they want it ejecting to the right or left. But the other factor to consider is whether they're using their right or their left eye predominantly for um, sighting. Okay. Well, let's say generally speaking, a right handed shooter is right eye dominant. Um, that pistol there is going to eject the shells in a right direction. That is correct. Okay, so if I'm holding a pistol, my finger pistol, it's deadly, watch out. Um, if I'm right-handed holding my pistol on the right hand, the shells from that are going to eject out away from my body. Correct. That's correct, they will come this direction so they will not cross over you. Okay, if I have a semi-automatic pistol that is associated with more of a left and favorable shooters uh, ejection. If I'm holding that with the right hand, it's going to eject to the left and it's a semi-automatic pistol. So you can shoot more than one time, correct? That's correct. 
I'm going to have cartridges ejecting across my line of sight. That is correct. If this ejected from the left side of the pistol and I'm right eye focused, it's going to eject this direction. And uh, having spit shell casings, if I'm shooting more than one time going across my line of sight, might not be optimal aim, uh, optimal shooting and aiming uh, conditions to have stuff going right across my face. For aiming purposes, yes. Okay. So if you had somebody that was left eye dominant and a shooter that was uh, left handed, it would probably be better to have a semi-automatic pistol that ejects to the left. If I were that shooter, that is how I would prefer the design. Okay. So did you say that is a pistol that ejects to the right? Yes, it is. And so that would be a pistol that would favor a right-handed shooter, right height dominant. That's how I would prefer it if I were the shooter. Okay. Now, uh, may I approach the witness? You can put that back. Thank you. May I approach? I'm going to show you what's been previously marked as People's Exhibit 713. <clears throat> So the two, uh, if you can look at this, the, you have the actual bullet, the part that comes out of the shell. Uh, there's three of them there. Are those two that were recovered from the pillow and one that was your test fire, or are those all three test fires from the different pistols? These are all three test fires from the one Smith & Wesson pistol. So they're all three samples from the same pistol. Okay. So you, and that was the nine millimeter Smith and Wesson? Correct. Okay. So you did three test fires from there. Uh, do you have the bullets or can you get the exhibit with the two bullets that were pulled from the pillow? That would be exhibit 103. Sure. Well, I'll take your word for it, Judge, because I can't yeah, find yeah. it. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, exhibit 103. Now, where is one of the bullets in this that was pulled from a pillow? There were two bullets. Both of them. So this one here and this one here. This one here and this one here. Yes. And which one was the bullet that uh, came from the deceased boy? That one is People's Exhibit 88. Okay. All right. And it looks like there's a lot of, it looks like there's different, deformation or uh, the bullets fragmenting in all three of them, correct? They are definitely deformed to various degrees, yes. Okay, but the one that was pulled out of the individual looks to be more deformed than the bullets that were pulled out of the, the pillow. Uh, yes, I would say the, the nose is more fully expanded and there's slightly more deformation in that one, yes. Okay, and if you know that's great, if not, that's fine. Would you expect two nine millimeter hollow points. Uh, it looks like they were Hornaday manufacturer of the shells. Would you expect those uh, bullets to actually penetrate through the pillow? If they went through nothing else? Yes. Just the pillow? Yeah. I would expect a nine millimeter of this design to go through the pillow. Okay. And is it your information that the two rounds that came from the pillow, it looks like in your report, it says source or it men mentions pillow. Uh, do you know if they went through anything else other than the pillow? I do not. I can simply state that they have hard impact damage that suggests something other than the pillow came into contact with these items. Okay. Do you think that these two bullets, um, Do you have any idea what that could have been? That the two bullets that were not pulled from the individual, what they could have impacted based on the history and what information you were giving for this analysis? 
I would say based on the history and information, no. Um, based on some of the trace evidence that I observed present on the bullet and stuck in the bullet, um, I, there was evidence of it having passed through biological substances. So there was evidence of um, possible bone and possible hairs present on the surfaces of those bullets. Okay. So can you tell the distance that the two bullets that were recovered from the pillow, how far away those bullets were when they were, or how far the shooter was away when uh, those bullets were fired? I cannot, in this instance, I did not have the opportunity to evaluate the pillow and there was no distance testing performed. Okay. Uh, and were you aware that the pillow was actually taken into evidence and recovered? I was aware of very little more than these were recovered from the pillow. Okay. Would it have been, been a, a benefit to you and your analyses uh, to have had the pillow where the bullets came from to examine it and possibly do separate test fires into that pillow? The only time that would have come into play for me is if there had been testing requested to determine how far away um, those surfaces were when they were shot into. Okay. Was any of this biological material from the two bullets that were recovered from the pillow, uh, was any of this biological material tested or collected to be submitted for DNA analysis or uh, any type of work like that? It was most certainly collected by me when I evaluated the bullets. I preserved that evidence in case additional testing was warranted on them. I am not aware if any further testing was undertaken after I collected it. Okay, but you felt it was important enough to at least collect it and preserve it. Certainly important to preserve it, especially considering that my handling would have obstructed it and destroyed it during my process. So it was important to preserve that in case it became necessary for testing down the line. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Director. Thank you, Ms. Hap, um, when you were talking about um, shell casings ejecting out of the right or left, uh, would you say that, um, well, you tell us, um, are most guns manufactured to kick to the right? The large majority are manufactured with a right hand ejection, yes. Uh, does it require some special hunting to find a gun that will kick off to the left? Sometimes special hunting, there are a few manufacturers if you want your firearm in that configuration that you might seek out specifically, or you can consider purchasing a different slide for that firearm to allow that function. In your opinion, as an expert, um, is it common for a weapon like this that the shell casings kick to the right can be handled equally as effectively by either a right or left handed person? Yes, it can. Or a right eye or left eye dominant person? It can. Um, <clears throat> Were you aware that uh, the shell casings recovered from that pillow were in a suitcase with a decomposing body? I became aware of that later, yes. Um, could that have been contributing to some of the um, biological substances that you found on those two fire or those two projectiles? That certainly contributed to some of it, yes. And then um, as it relates to other types of scientific testing, um, is it very common or not very common to find fingerprints on bullets? On fired bullets, yeah. um, it would be very uncommon to find that after a bullet passes through the barrel. Theoretically, the way that would work is the fingerprint would be deposited before it was fired. Then that bullet is going to pass down the barrel of the firearm. And as that happens, the action of the bullet rubbing in the inside of the barrel would obliterate the fingerprint. Further, if anything should sustain the firing process as it goes into that target surface, again, that bullet will be wiped clean of whatever was present on it fingerprint wise. What about on shell casings? On shell casings, um, there's a there's a greater likelihood that fingerprints can be recovered on shell casings. One, because this casing doesn't go through anything after it's been fired. Um, however, there are elements of contact with the cartridge case and the body of the cartridge case inside the chamber of the firearm that may obliterate that. There's also a heat buildup that occurs when firing happens that may affect the cartridge case as well. So typically when we're successful with recovering fingerprints on fired cartridge cases, it's because they've been picked up afterwards and moved. What about, um, can you find fingerprints on shell casings that are never found in an investigation? Uh, no, that would be a definite no. That's all I have, thank you.
Do any of the jurors have any questions for us? Pass it forward and. Uh, Ms. Hap, did any of the three pistols you examined eject from the left? They did not. All three of these ejected to the right of the firearm. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask this question. I, uh, let me know if you think it's outside your area of expertise. If someone is left eye dominant and a shell ejects across your field of vision, would that cause someone to miss? So in that regard, I would say there's a couple things to consider. The first thing is that first shot that's fired, nothing will be obstructing your vision. We would be talking about subsequent shot fired after that, and we would be talking about subsequent shots fired in rapid succession, meaning not a shot. That cartridge case ejection is quick. So the shot is fired, the cartridge case ejects and falls, often much faster than the shooter can recognize. Where that becomes a more serious consideration is firing of multiple cartridges where those shells are constantly running in front of the shooter's field of vision. I hope that okay. covers it. I will allow reasonable follow-up as to those questions only. Prosecution? Are there a lot of factors that can go into accuracy of a shooter? Oh, absolutely. Um, can you list off some of those? Um, the firearm is one. Whether or not that shooter is practiced is a primary, it, it's probably the biggest. Um, can left eye dominant shooters with a gun that kicks off to the right be very accurate in their in their shots? Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Cook. Thank you. Ms. Hap, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to clean up the witness stand, Judge, before the next witness. All right. Brooke, you can call your next witness, please. Uh, thanks, Judge. We'd call Brooke Bell to the stand. Ms. Bell, if you would step forward and raise your right hand, please, ma'am. Do you swear from the testimony about to give this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth?
personnel to do a search of the residence. Uh, part of the information that they had and that they passed on to me was that an incident, as it, it was, was called, called, had occurred on the 26th in which Gannon was playing video games in the basement living room. And a candle was knocked over, damaged the carpet and a couch in the basement. Uh, they had informed me there was a section of carpet down in the basement that had been burned and cut away down to the padding. And so that it was suspicious in nature, it had been covered with carpet and an area rug. Did you receive any information about a potential sexual assault or kidnapping on the 29th of January? So I did a little bit further uh, once I'd been on scene for a little bit longer. I believe it was possibly during our walkthrough. Uh, the information that they provided to me was uh, that uh, Gannon's stepmother, who was identified to me as Leticia Stout, uh, had contacted a, an individual about the carpet repair and that that individual came to the house and she was sexually assaulted in Gannon's bedroom and that Gannon had been kidnapped. And so did that change um, at least your game plan on how you're going to process that crime scene based on this new information that comes in? So with the information I had on this very first response, the areas that I'm focused on is the downstairs living room where this area of carpet has been burned down to the padding or basically down to the subfloor. Uh, which is unusual and had been cut out and removed. And then with this possible sexual assault information, so that was some new information, and having a location uh, that told me that I was going to search for evidence that might be potentially related to that in that bedroom. And so what kind of evidence would you be looking for based on that? So when we're in the case of a sexual assault, uh, we use what's called an alternate light source and uh, filtered goggles. And so we actually will check the room for possible biological fluids. Uh, certain biological fluids will fl fluoresce or glow uh, under ALS. And those tend to be biological fluids such as urine, uh, saliva, and then semen. Uh, so in the case of a sexual assault, we're using that so that we can try and identify uh, potentially semen. Had you learned that the residents had a, 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 at least initially been searched the night before on January 28th, 2020 by some El Paso County uh, detectives? Yes, I had been informed that they had conducted a separate search prior to the involvement of the Metro Crime Lab and that there were some evidence items collected during that search. And so were you uh, at least the first time a CSI lab personnel entered the residence to conduct the search? Yes, so I was one of the first responding CSIs. And, and Your Honor, um, just to kind of speed things up a little bit, uh, there's going to be no objections to the following exhibits. Okay. 373 through 441 okay. and 711. And defense, do you agree? I do. All right, then exhibits 373 through 441 are admitted and so is 711 go ahead and it's a combination of photographs mostly photographs but also physical exhibits your honor and we'll okay. as we go through the photographs we'll get the physical exhibits okay if we could start with people's exhibit 373 please publishing yep and if i may approach the witness uh Ms. Bell, I'll give you the pictures and you can either use the pictures to look at or Thank you. the TV screens that we have. And then you got a fancy pointer up here somewhere. Is yeah. that what this is? It's home screen. Okay. So what do we see in People's Exhibit uh, 373? People's Exhibit 373 is a photograph that was taken of the exterior of Mandan Street. Uh, if we're looking to the left side of the photograph, we can actually see the Metro Crime Lab van, which was parked in front of 6627. So what direction are we facing here with this photograph? Uh, we are mostly looking east, slightly southeast. And so could you use the pointer and point out 6627 Mandan? May I stand, Your Honor? You may. Go ahead. You can step down if you would like to. Thank you. 
6627 would be this residence right here, and it had a bright yellow chair uh, on the porch. And the first house that we see on the right photograph, is that 6643, Mandon? I wouldn't be able to tell from the photograph in terms of reading the address. Okay. If we can go to 674 now. What do we see in 674? 374. Oh, 374. I'm all over the place. <laughs> 374. So People's Exhibit uh, 374 is a direct uh, photograph of the front of the residence 6627. And we can see that bright yellow chair that I had previously mentioned. <coughs> we go 375 now. What are we looking at 375? People's Exhibit 375. And I don't recall just from seeing this image if this is, I believe it's from immediately inside the entry. So if we walked in the door, uh, that it would be one of the walls on the side. Would this be the laundry room area? It's possible. I can't really tell from seeing the rest of it, but it's possible. Okay. If you look to the right-hand corner, top corner, it, would that be the entry to the garage? Yes, it would be. So with that being said, then this would be the entry into the into the house through the garage, which was first the laundry room. We can go to 376 now, please. What do we see in 376? So People's Exhibit 376 is, and I don't know if this is the washer or the dryer, but in the bottom of the photograph, we see the red. Uh, and there were a pair of tennis shoes. So they're black with white soles turned over on top. And uh, part of my walkthrough and briefing information I had received was that uh, when the sheriff's deputies responded on the 28th, they had observed possible stains on the bottom of these shoes and had collected swabs of those stains. And did you say that was done on the previous night, January 28th? That's correct. So when I mentioned they had collected some evidence on that first response, uh, that was one of those items. 377, please. Is this a close-up of the same shoes? Yes, it is. And then, Your Honor, 378 are the actual shoes. And just for the jury's benefit, we're going to be opening those with another witness. Okay. Uh, so we're not going to be opening those at this time. All right. We can go to 379 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 379? So People's Exhibit 379 is a photograph inside the garage. Uh, and if we look in the upper left-hand corner, we can actually see the door that's open, and that's what opens into the laundry room. Now, on January 29th, were you looking for blood in this particular garage? Uh, not initially. Uh, however, it was uh, brought to our attention uh, when uh, a deputy had responded that while we were working on documentation in the basement, that he had located uh, some stains that he believed to be possible blood stains. We can go to 380 now, please. What do we see in People's Exhibit 380? People's Exhibit 380, uh, we've actually moved further into the garage, so now we're closer to the entry door. And there are actually three sticker scales present in this photograph that were placed to identify those uh, possible blood stains that were located by the deputy. Could you please point those out for the I jury? will, yes. And Mr. Young, could you find a reasonable breaking point in the next five minutes or so? We could stop now if you like, Judge. Okay. Whatever, whatever you're there. Uh, you can go ahead and answer that question and we'll take that okay. break. And is it okay? May I stand again? Thank you. So when we look in the middle stair in the garage right here, we can see a sticker that was actually identifying a possible blood stain that we labeled A. And then we have two more on the floor. Uh, so possible blood stain B and possible blood stain C. All right. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we will take our uh, we'll take another recess for about 10 minutes. If I can have everyone back in the jury room a little bit before four o'clock, we should be able to start right on time at that point. Uh, don't discuss case among yourselves. Don't discuss case with anyone else. Um, with that, all rise for the jury, please.
Thank you. May all be seated. Record should reflect the jury has left the courtroom. Uh, court will be in recess until four o'clock. All rise.
Court will call 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury's not present in the courtroom. Um, I want to let, uh, alert the attorneys uh, to a juror issue, um, and we can either discuss it now, we can discuss it at the end of the day. Um, uh, I don't know what you want to do. All I know is that a juror has alerted me that she, it wasn't until uh, Ms. Hap was on the stand that she realized she knew her. She did not recognize the name as she was looking through the uh, witness list. So I don't know anything about how she knows her or anything like that. Um, my thought was I would bring her in, ask her a couple of questions, and then um, send her back, and you can make a decision as to whether or not um, you want to make a challenge or we go from there. We could either do that before this witness continues her testimony. We can wait until we get closer to the end of the day. What do you want to do? I think it'd be good to do that towards the end of the day, Jeff. Okay. Maybe save a little bit of time at the end of the day to handle That's it. fine. All right. So let's stop at like uh, uh, 10 till. Uh, stop your questioning there, and then we will bring that juror in, yeah. and we'll go from there. Does that work for? Juror 12, uh, third one over in the front. Yeah, well, she's in seat 13, but she's juror 12 because we only have nine in the back. So, okay. Okay, uh, in light of that, uh, let's bring the jurors in then. All rise for the jury, please. Thank you. May all be, uh, you may all be seated. Court will recall 20 CR 1358, People versus Letitia Stout. Record should reflect the jury has returned to the courtroom. Uh, when we took our break, we were in the midst of the direct examination of Ms. Bell. That's where we will resume. So, Ms. Bell, we still have People's Exhibit 380 up on the TV screen. Uh, with regards to these placards A, B, and C that you just pointed out prior to the break, are they in a uh, direction from the door to where there are some, looks like some two by fours on the ground there? So if you're referring to the lower left corner of the photograph, yes, there are some long two by fours in that area of the garage. And when we looked at the picture of the entire garage, is that a space where a vehicle may be parked? Typically it, it appeared to be where you'd pull a vehicle in, yes. Now, also on People's Exhibit 380, do you see any softball equipment in there or items related to softball? If we look to where the stairs are, uh, there's a blue bucket over on the right hand side of that photograph. There appears to be yellow softballs inside that blue bucket. And on the left side of the photograph, there appears to be some kind of bag that says Easton or, right? Yes, on the left side of the photograph on top of the green box. We go now to 381, please. What do we see in 381? People's Exhibit 381 uh, is actually a photograph taken standing inside the laundry room. So we can see the tile floor uh, looking down at the stairs. And in the center of the photograph, we can see that sticker scale that I mentioned previously. And that was the placard A, so the possible blood stains that were observed there. And just so um, Christian Luer just testified, uh, he processed this garage on February 3rd. Obviously, you did this on January 29th. Did you do uh, a, the blue star in the garage at that time, or did you note this blood just from your naked eye? 
So this was visible blood. So it was documented because we could see it without any type of chemical processing. And when I responded, I did not do or use Blue Star in the garage. And so we can go to 382 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 382? People's Exhibit 382 is a close-up photograph of the possible blood stains identified using Placard A. Right, if you do some more exercise, if you can get out and just show the jury exactly where the blood's located in this particular photograph. So we can see some dark staining throughout the center area of this photograph. Here, we can also see some slight discoloration over the left side of it. I know we're going to talk about how you swab these, but why don't we do it with placard A so you can kind of just show the jury what you did to collect this blood so that it could be tested. So, be at a later time. So, to collect a sample of any biological fluid, uh, we have a package that is sealed of two sterile cotton tip swabs. Uh, so, that's opened at the time that we're ready to collect the sample. Uh, we open a new package of distilled water and then just dampen uh, the two cotton tip swabs. And then those were both rubbed at the same time over uh, the stains and then placed back into that packaging and sealed into something we call a coin envelope. So it's a smaller envelope. And did you use three separate, separate swabs for both A, B, and C placards? Yes, they did. And they're separated when you package them? Correct. So when we place them in those individual coin envelopes, those are sealed separately from each other. And then the big envelope is sealed. And then whoever gets into that envelope would have to sign something to know that they've someone's been in there. Is that how it works? Correct. So when we create an evidence barcode label, and I believe in this case, all three of those swabs were placed in a larger envelope under the same evidence barcode and sealed uh, by the crime scene investigator. And then any subsequent testing that occurs on evidence within that package, uh, the evidence item or the packaging is noted, and then additional tape seals are added and signed by uh, that analyst uh, when the analysis is completed. And Yonder, for the record, the swabs from placards A, B, and C is item, or People's Exhibit 386. All right. We can go now to 383, please. What do we see in People's Exhibit 383? People's Exhibit 383 uh, we is a little bit of a different perspective, a little closer where we can see, again, the two sticker scales that were on the garage floor uh, were close to those uh, two by fours that were previously mentioned. 384. People's Exhibit 384 is now a close-up photograph of the possible blood stains identified using placard B. Could you point those out with a pointer, please? Yes. So in this photograph, it's really concentrated toward the center, but the discoloration is in this general area and then extended into the upper left portion of the photograph. And is that the area you swabbed then that we talked about earlier? Yes, that would be the area that representative samples were collected. Uh, 385, you could probably stay there for this one. What do we see in 385? People who look at 385 is now a close up of the stains that were identified using placard C. And I will point those out again uh, just directly above uh, the actual sticker scale and then a little higher toward the center of the photograph. Now, are these particular more visible? These blood, are they droplets or what are they? So these appear to be more consistent with possible transfer stains to me. Uh, but these are a little bit more visible in this particular photograph than what we saw in B. Uh, if we look at the photograph, there's different photographs at different angles of B and C, and B is a little more visible in a different angle, and that just has more to do with the flash that occurred when that photograph was taken. What's a transfer stain? So a transfer stain is when blood is deposited on a surface from another surface. Kind of speaks for itself, right? <laughs> it's, just, it's just transferred onto an object. You can resume your seat. Thank you. If we can have 387 now, please. What do we see in People's Exhibit 387? People's Exhibit 387 is a photograph that was taken in the backyard on the east side of the house. And of significance in the backyard is a uh, the trash dumpster. So we can see the green 
in the center of the photograph. And were you made aware that this these trash cans were searched on January 28th? Yes, I was. Uh, 2020? Yes. Let's go to People's Exhibit 388. What do we see in People's Exhibit 388? People's Exhibit 388 is a photograph taken in uh, the basement, and this area was referred to in most of our reports as the basement living area. So this particular photograph, I believe in terms of orientation, we're looking southwest in the basement. In the area that you alluded to, I know we have some other pictures of it where there were potential burn marks on the carpet. Could you just point that out for the jury so they could have some context with this picture? Yes. And I'm going to stand up to do that. Sure. So in the upper right corner of the photograph, uh, we have a couch here. And directly in front of that couch was an area rug, and we can actually see that here. And uh, on top of it, in this particular photograph, you can see a section, rectangular section of carpet that matches uh, the rest of the carpet throughout the residence. Okay, thank you. Uh, 389. What do we see in 389? People's Exhibit 389 is now standing in that living area portion of the room. Uh, so in the lower left corner, we can see that area rug that I had previously mentioned. Uh, and then we can also see the corner of the couch that it was in front of, and that's over on the left side of the photograph. Uh, in the center of the photograph, so we're looking east toward that, that love seat chair. Uh, there's three blankets, and they were kind of in a pile, and those blankets had burned debris on them. You can go to 390 now. What do we see in 390? People's Exhibit 390 is a close-up of those blankets that was located on the floor in front of that love seat, and we are able to see some of the charring and bur burned debris. 391? What do we see in 391? People's Exhibit 391 is uh, now in the search phase uh, where we're actually uh, looking at the items that were identified. So one of the blankets has been spread out and we can see that there's a scale in this photograph uh, showing where some dark burned debris is. And did you spread this blanket out to take this photograph? Yes. And did you collect this blanket as evidence? This blanket was collected, yes. We can go to 392. What do we see in 392? People's Exhibit 392 is just a close-up of the previous blanket in the area where we saw that scale of the burned debris. And did you have any information as to whether or not these blankets were used to put the fire out or help put the fire out? I don't know that I had specific information how these were related. 393? What do we see in 393? People's Exhibit 393 is another one of the blankets that was in that pile. And on the left side of the photograph, we can see where it's bunched together and the discoloration. So where there was some black char marks. And go to 394. People's Exhibit 394 is a photograph of the third blanket. Uh, we can see that there's a scale and that was also very bunched around some burn debris. And did you collect all these blankets, all three? All three of them were collected, yes. We can go to 395 now, please. What do we see in 395? People's Exhibit 395 is the couch that is uh, located that I had pointed out in the first photograph when we were talking about the living room. Uh, so for context, that area where the removed carpet is directly in front of this couch. And on this couch are three teal pillows. Can you also see some... Uh, <laughs> what appears to be damage from hot wax, that kind of thing on this couch? Yes. So over in the left side of the photograph, which would have been the west portion of the couch, uh, there was some damage consistent with what appeared to be wax on the couch, as well as some, some charring or scorch marks. And so for the record, we see a remote control there. Is it just uh, next to that remote control in front of it? It would be in front of and then to the left of that black remote control. We can go to 396, please. What do we see in 396? People's Exhibit 396 is looking toward the southwest corner of the living room. So just for context, uh, we can see the TV in the upper left. And the couch, for reference, would be over on the right side of the photograph. And there's an additional teal pillow in that corner on the floor. 397? What do we see in 397? 
People's Exhibit 397 is uh, more of a mid-range photograph, but we've actually turned that pillow over. And in the center of the photograph, it's actually going to be in the right corner of the pillow. There was more of that kind of burned charred material. We can go to 398 now. Is that what you're talking about as we see in 398? So 398 is a close-up uh, with the scale. And yes, you can better see some of that burned material. And did you collect this item uh, as evidence? This yes, pillow? this pillow was collected. And for the record, John, that's 399, People's Exhibit 399. We can go to 400 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 400? People's Exhibit 400 is actually being posi positioned against the west wall in the living room. So the couch, for reference, is what's on the left. And that love seat is over on the right. In the lower right-hand corner, we can see some of those blankets we talked about previously. Uh, but in the back center of this photograph, uh, we can see an open door where we see boxes and bins. And that was a basement storage unit. And can we see the staircase there to the left of that poach or in the center of the picture, but it would go off to the left to go upstairs? Right? Yes, you can slightly see the, the banister or the hand railing, and that would be the staircase that leads to the upper level. And so as you look at that storage room, if you go to the right, would that be where Gannon's room was? Yes. So there is a hallway behind that wall, uh, or, and his door was over to the right and actually shared a wall with the storage room. We can go to People's Exhibit 401. What do we see in People's Exhibit 401? People's Exhibit 401, we've now moved close to the entry to the storage room. Uh, so again, we can see the boxes and bins and then the concrete floor. And then as mentioned previously, there's a short hallway on the right side. Uh, so the door to Gannon's bedroom would be over on the right. People's Exhibit 402. What do we see 402? People's Exhibit 402 is a photograph that's taken standing in the entry uh, to the uh, basement storage room, so the bins and boxes previously mentioned. Uh, in this photograph, we're actually looking toward the southeast corner, and uh, an item of interest that was observed in the southeast corner, uh, which we can see in the center of the photograph, is a small section of carpet. With regards to the boxes that we see in People's Exhibit 402, is that what it looked like on January 29th, 2020? These uh, appear to be the original overall photographs. So that's the series of photographs that we take prior to doing anything on scene. So this would be the condition of the storage room when we arrived. We can go to People's Exhibit 403. What do we see in People's Exhibit 403? People's Exhibit 403 is now standing inside uh, that storage room. And on the left side, we can see the furnace and toward the center, we can see the water heater. Uh, those were actually positioned on the same wall, which would be the west wall as the entry into the storage room. People's Exhibit 404. What do we see in People's Exhibit 404? People's Exhibit 404 is just slightly rotated to the right from that previous photo and down so that we can see the concrete floor if it helps for reference in terms of from the previous photo, that bottle of gain uh, in the previous photo, if you go back one. So we're at 403 now? So it's shifted slightly to the right and down. And go back to 404. Now in People's Exhibit 404, there seems to be a box there at the lower portion middle there. Do you recognize that box? I do. So in the lower portion of the photograph, there is a box that has Amazon tape. And if I recall correctly, based on the marker, the writing on it, that was a box that was collected in a uh, following response out to that residence. Did you go back to the residence on February 21st, 2020? I did, yes. And did you go back and completely clean out this entire storage room, look at every item that's in there, look at all the floor for blood? Yes, so that was the purpose of that following response was to remove every item from the storage room and inspect it for possible blood stains. And this is where the box was, at least on January 29th, 2020, when you initially searched that storage room. Yes, based on the overall photographs, it is. We'll talk about that box when we get to the February 21st, okay? Okay. Don't let me forget. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go to, I'm sorry. Ready? Okay, if we can go to 405 now, please. 
What do we see in People's Exhibit 405? People's Exhibit 405, uh, we're actually looking at the north wall of the storage room. So for orientation, based on where I'm standing, the entry would actually be back into my right. And of interest in this particular photograph on the left side is uh, a gun box, the MNP bodyguard. And then also of interest in this photograph, uh, kind of toward the northeast corner, uh, we can see the corner of a red suitcase underneath a box. And then just to the right of that, we can see a small section of carpet again. Did you do the best you could to take pictures of all the suitcases in the storage room? So in this series of overall photographs, these are the photographs of all of the items in their position when we arrived. So nothing was moved in order to be able to take better photographs of them at this point. It, you may not, I don't know if you recall this or not, but the pink suitcase that we see in the center of the photograph, was that suitcase there on February 21st, 2020, when you went back and searched the entire storage room? I don't recall offhand without going through those photos and looking closer. Don't let me forget about that one either. Okay. There's another item. Uh, I want to refer to a tub there that appears to have tables in it uh, that's on the right-hand side of the photograph in the center there. Do you see that? I do. So all the way along the right edge, we can see a clear tub that has a purple handle. You can see just the edge of it. Uh, so that was another item of interest uh, that was located and collected on a following response on the 21st. And at least on January 29th, 2020, that's where that tub is when you're out there processing the storage room. That's correct. And did that tub later have blood on it? Uh, it had what appeared to be possible blood stains on it when I observed it. You don't like it when I say blood, right? Unfortunately, we're not allowed to say that uh, because we can't confirm it, uh, but based on our training and experience, that was the reason it was collected. It, it appeared consistent with blood stains. And is that why we talked about that Amazon box earlier as well? Correct. So there were possible blood stains observed on that box. Okay. We can now go to people's exhibit. What are we at? 406, please. What do we see in people's exhibit 406? So People's Exhibit 406, we've uh, rotated slightly to the right from the previous photograph. Uh, so we're now looking at the southeast corner of the storage room. Uh, for reference, again, in the lower left-hand corner, we see that red suitcase that I mentioned previously. Uh, it's very difficult to see, but just a tiny piece of the carpet in the lower left corner. And uh, the previously mentioned clear tub with the purple handle. And if it helps again with reference, the wall over on the right side is actually the wall uh, that would be shared with Gannon's bedroom. We can go to 407 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 407? So People's Exhibit 407 is at the point where we've started removing some objects from the uh, basement storage room. So uh, we can now see that red suitcase a little bit more clearly. And there are some carpet fibers sitting on top. And then directly behind it, slightly to the right, we can see a larger section of carpet that I had mentioned that was mostly covered in some of those previous overall photographs. And as you're searching the storage room on January 29th, 2020, as well as February 21st, 2020, did you ever see a large olive green suitcase in the storage room? I don't recall seeing one. Did you ever see the suitcase that Gannon's body was recovered in? No, I did not. Have you ever seen it under the bridge or at any time? I have not seen it at all. If you would have saw that in that time, would you have photographed it as you photographed these suitcases here? Well, everything was photographed as I observed it during that time. And, and obviously the suitcase was found sometime later, uh, but I was never shown what that suitcase looked like. And do we also see the tub that you said had presumptive blood on it uh, in this photograph? So that clear tub with the purple handles, yes, is over on the right side of the photograph. We can go to 408 now, please. What do we see in People's Exhibit 408? People's Exhibit 408 is now a closer photograph of the top of that uh, red suitcase. And toward the back area is actually where we can see some of the carpet fibers and carpet debris. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, but did you later find some carpet that had been cut to kind of cover that area where the burnt carpet was? Yes. Yes, they did. Did you eventually collect the carpet that we see in People's Exhibit 408? 
Yes. Yeah, so during the search portion of, of this storage room, that section of carpet was actually pulled out of that room and opened. And at this point for the jury where the carpet is on this photograph, just so we all know where it's So your red suitcase and then kind of the carpet fibers and debris toward the back. And then uh, the large folded section of carpet is directly behind it in the center of the photograph up top. Great, thank you. We can go to 409 now, please. What do we see in 409? People's Exhibit 409 is a close up so that you can better see some of the carpet debris and carpet fibers on top of that suitcase. And then to the right side, we can see a part of that carpet. 410? What do we see in People's Exhibit 410? People's Exhibit 410 is when that section of carpet was uh, pulled out of the storage room. Uh, it had been rolled and folded. And when I opened the fold, uh, in, concealed inside was a smaller piece of carpet uh, that had possible blood stains on it. And can you point that out for the jury just so we can distinguish between the small piece and the large piece? So the large portion of the carpet was this entire section. And then the small section concealed inside, right in the center uh, where we can see some very visible staining. Can we go to 412 now, please? What do we see in 412? People's Exhibit 412 is a close-up photograph of uh, the possible blood stains observed on that smaller piece of carpet. Uh, and then we do have a scale in the photograph. And you collected the smaller piece of carpet, I take it? Uh, both sections of carpet were collected, yes. And the small uh, piece of carpet, Your Honor, would be People's Exhibit 413. The large piece is People's Exhibit 711. All right. We can go to 414 now. What do we see in 414? People's Exhibit 412. 412, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's helpful to have these photos up here. Uh, People's Exhibit 412 is that smaller section of carpet that we just saw the photographs of with the visible stains it's now been turned over uh, and what's of note in this photograph is that we can see some additional stains on the top surface in the lower right corner and in the center and that the actual entire section of carpet is discolored in comparison to the rest of the carpet uh, underneath and could you tell whether or not looking at these stains on either side, whether what kind of stain it is? You, you alluded to transfer stains when we were in the garage. Not necessarily, at least on the upper side of the carpet, uh, due to the texture of the carpet. Uh, looking on the other side, uh, the fact that it's gone through, uh, typically we might call something like that a saturation stain, uh, where it has actually gone through the carpet. So is that what we're talking about as we see in 411? Yes. So that's more of a saturated stain? Potentially. Uh, it's difficult to say, uh, but it is consistent with some type of transfer or saturation stain. Now we can jump ahead to 414. What do we see in 414? People's Exhibit 414. Uh, so this large section of carpet that I removed that had the smaller one with the visible stains, when I opened that entire section of carpet, there were two corners that had been cut off and were missing. The, this People's Exhibit 414 shows a section of carpet. So when we go back into the living room, and I had mentioned that there was a section of carpet placed over the area that had been cut out. This is showing that section of carpet that had been in the living room and uh, showing the uh, visible seams appearing to match as if that section of carpet had been cut off this larger one. Going back to the red suitcase with carpet fibers on it, the carpet's found right next to that? Yes, so that's that very big folded one. Uh, that's that piece of carpet. Mm -hmm. Would it be consistent with someone cutting the carpet over the suitcase in the storage room? I don't know where it would have been cut, uh, but having the carpet fibers on top of the suitcase just indicates to me that that carpet had been moved or manipulated. Okay. We can go to 415 now. What do we see in People's Exhibit 415? So People's Exhibit 415, uh, we are now seeing that area in the basement living room in front of the couch 
So for reference, the couch is in the upper right hand corner. You can see the remote and those burn marks on the couch that we had talked about previously. Uh, we can see a patch of carpet has been cut out in a square or rectangle. And then we can see the black padding underneath. And uh, it might be difficult to tell in this photograph, but the, the shape and characteristics were um, pretty consistent and appeared to be burn and char marks in that padding. 416. People's Exhibit 416 shows a patch of carpet covering that. In the right side of the photograph, we can see that area rug we talked about previously as well that's been pulled back. So when we arrived, that area rug was in place as if it, was, it would be normally on the floor. And when it was pulled back, this is what we observed was this extra piece of carpet placed on top of that cutout and uh, that previous one showing the cutout corner that was matched with the seams is this piece of carpet. We can go back to 416, please. Uh, 415. And people that did the 415, um, what was your understanding on how this fire started that we see the results from in 415? The information that I was provided was that while Gannon was playing video games on the 26th, he knocked over a candle and somehow that caused uh, the fire. Is that consistent with your training, your everyday knowledge, a candle falling on the carpet, burning right through the carpet, through the pad, all the way to the concrete? That's not what I would expect to see, no. Why is that? I wouldn't expect... A lot of carpet and materials are made to be more burn resistant. So you could hold a lighter to carpet and it's not instantaneously going to burst into flames. Uh, I, we've also had training with our local fire department where we've actually done that exercise, laid carpet out, held a lighter or a torch, trying to set it on fire, and then doing that with different ignitable fluids to see the dis the, the how long it would take to actually set and burst into flames. Would it take a significant amount of heat to create that char mark? It would, and it would be have to be a sustained heat. So not just a quick, without some type of ignitable source. Now, with regards to this area, did you, the jury's heard about Blue Star, so we don't need to get in that, but did you Blue Star this area to see whether or not there's areas that you needed to swap? Yes. So uh, on that first response, because this is the area of the primary disturbance and, and things out of the ordinary, that's the room they requested I do Blue Star in. And it was done in this area. Yes. And did you swab that area based on the results of your Blue Star? Uh, there were swabs collected uh, from a few areas in the living room. Yes. Based on a presumptive positive. Can you point out the general area where you swab? <laughs> I remember correctly uh, the area on the carpet that I had a presumptive positive reaction was in this section, uh, which would be the lower left portion of that cutout square. And uh, same process as you did in the garage, sealed, so others could test that swab at a later time? That's correct, yes. Now, before we leave the January 29th search, did you also go into Gannon's room on the 29th? Yes, we did. Uh, did you uh, smell anything when you went into Gannon's room? So as a part of the walkthrough with one of the detectives who had been there the previous day on the 28th, he had mentioned an unusual, and that's how it was described to me, an unusual odor in Gannon's bedroom uh, near the center and an unusual odor near the light switch. Uh, so I did detect an odor in the room, but it wasn't one necessarily that I could place. I couldn't characterize it as something that was familiar to me as traditional bleach or uh, cleaning products. Uh, also of note uh, was that uh, there was odor of urine, uh, so pet urine throughout the basement, including in there. And did you know they had a couple dogs that lived in the house as well? I did. I don't know if it showed the photographs, but in the area next to the basement living room along the south wall, there were two dog crates and there were actually dogs in them at the time that I was there. And so in between January 29th and February 21st, had other members of your lab, the Metro Crime Lab, gone out to search this residence? Yes. Um, had you gone out there on different occasions as well? 
I had been out there a total of three times, uh, but I wasn't with each of the CSIs for each time the Metro Crime Lab responded. And so on the January 29th and February 21st, you did a report based on what you did at that residence? That's correct. And others would do reports based on what they did, for instance, on February 3rd or February 5th, that kind of thing? Yes. So uh, I did respond on February 3rd, but I did not complete a report. Uh, CSI Lewer was the primary CSI who responded and I came to assist. And based on uh, items that were located during that search, we also called an additional CSI, CSI Alyssa Berriesford, to come out and assist with some documentation. So I assisted both of them, uh, but since I didn't do anything independently of them, I didn't complete a report for that, for that response. So let's now talk about the 21st, uh, February. Okay. Uh, what new information did you get with regards to why you needed to go back and search the residents again? Uh, the basic information that I was provided uh, was uh, from Sergeant Hubble with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office that he wanted to remove and search all of the objects in the basement storage room for possible blood stains. And uh, I don't know the specifics to why, but I know that a meeting had occurred prior to my going out that day between the Sheriff's Office and the FBI, and there was some interest in uh, some saws in the garage. Had there been a board found that may have had some blood on it out in the Palmer Lake area? Yes. So right before responding, I had also been informed uh, that a particle board had been recovered near Larkspur off Highway 105, I believe it was, and that there were possible blood stains on it. And I was shown a photograph of what was recovered by one of our DNA analysts. And we observed that a corner or a small section of that particle board was missing. And so they also asked that we search the garage to see if that possible corner was in there. And did you find a possible corner for that particular board? No, we did not. And before we, we move on, your honor, 417 is the swabs that were taken from the basement carpet that uh, CSI Brooke testified to earlier. So we can now go to 418. Now we're on February 21st, 2020. Uh, what does this mean, people's visit 418? So People's Exhibit 418 is a similar photograph to one we've seen before, uh, just at a later date of the entry to the basement storage room. Uh, and we can see it looks significantly different. It's more organized. I can see more of the floor in this photograph. So someone went through and stacked all the boxes neatly, it looks like, and there were items moved around differently than what they looked like on January 29th. It certainly appears far more organized than when I saw it the first time, yes. We can go to 419 uh, now. What do we see in 419? People's Exhibit 419 is an additional photograph inside uh, that basement storage room. We can see again part of the floor and see that the boxes are a little more organized. And we see a tub there that appears to have cables in it on the top left corner of that photograph. That's correct. So that is that tub we've discussed previously, the clear one with the purple handles on top. 420. What do we see in People's Exhibit 420? People's Exhibit 420 is a uh, same angle as the previous shot, just rotated up. So now we can actually see the top portion of that tub that we had mentioned before on the left side of the photograph. 421. Now what do we see in 421? People's Exhibit 421 is when the tub has been removed and uh, placed in the uh, basement living room uh, so that we can inspect it better with flashlights uh, to search for possible blood stains. And did you do that? I did do that, yes. 422. What do we see in 422? People's Exhibit 422 is a photograph that I actually took during the evidence processing portion. So this was taken, I believe, a few days later in the lab. Uh, with the evidence barcode label and as an overall photograph of the item. And for the record, People's Exhibit 423 is this plastic tub that we see in People's Exhibit 422. All right. Uh, 424. What do we see in People's Exhibit 424? People's Exhibit 424 uh, is photograph. These are photographs taken in the lab. And what I've done in these is added the adhesive sticker scales that were used for those blood stains on the garage floor just to highlight them. Uh, and these are going to be close up photographs showing stains that were visible on this tub. So, just to the left of this marker, we see what? 
So between the purple handle and the sticker scale, we can see some, some visible stains consistent with possible blood stains. 425? What do we see in 425? People's Exhibit 425 is another uh, sticker scale. And this was placed to show uh, the discoloration located at the corner of the tub uh, all the way to the left. 426? People's Exhibit 426 is that same corner. We've just rotated to the other side. And just based on the change in light, we can actually see that there's some discoloration on both sides of the corner. 427. People's Exhibit 427 are some visible stains located to the left of the scale underneath the lid. 428. People's Exhibit 428 is showing a, a stain on the right side of the tub in this photograph uh, on the lip, the under part of underneath the lid. 429. People's Exhibit 429 is a close up. I believe we saw this particular stain. It might have been the first photograph that we showed, it's just a closer okay. photograph. 430. People's Exhibit 430 is an additional uh, possible blood stain located on the edge uh, after the lid was taken off. 431. People's Exhibit 431 are some additional uh, possible blood stains that are actually on the lip as well as uh, the underneath portion. And can you tell what kind of blood stains these are, whether they're transfer or drip? So these appear consistent with a transfer stain. We can actually see the visible uh, swipe marks. Um, that appear vertical uh, on, these, on these stains. And 432? People's Exhibit 432 appears to me to actually be the same stains as the previous photograph, just pulled back a little bit so you can see more of it. Now, do you know whether or not this tub actually went to a serologist, Sherry Holes, to do the swabbing and prepare it for DNA test? So this item was transferred directly to a DNA analyst. I believe I thought it was uh, Donna Minogue, but if it was Sherry, I would have to double check the chain of custody. But you didn't swab these blood stains? No. So at the request of our DNA unit, they were photographed and then they wanted to collect the samples for their testing. Okay. Now we can go to 433, please. What do we see in 433? People's Exhibit 433 was the cardboard box. Uh, we've talked about a couple of times now with the Amazon Prime tape and some of the um, Sharpie marks on it. And inside that box are two Apple iPhones. And on two sides of this box were stains that uh, appeared to be possible blood stains. A 434. <laughs> People's Exhibit. Go ahead. <laughs> People's Exhibit 434 is a photograph taken in the lab. Uh, so we can see the evidence barcode label that was created. This is an overall photograph. And in the upper left portion of the corner uh, to the left of the Amazon Prime tape, we can see two areas of stains. Yeah, for the record, 435 is the actual Amazon box. It's in evidence. Okay. 436. What do we see in 436? People's Exhibit 436 is a close-up of those two stains mentioned previously to the left of the Amazon tape. And would these be transfer stains or some other type of stain? They appear consistent based on some of the movement to be a transfer stain. 437? What do we see in 437? People's Exhibit 437 is an even closer photograph of the lower stain to the left of the Amazon tape. In People's Exhibit uh, 438. People's Exhibit 438 is actually the opposite side of the Amazon box and uh, was some visible uh, possible blood stains located there. Transfer stain? It appears consistent with as it, with a transfer stain with that movement and kind of clearing effect that we see. So if this is in fact blood, would that be consistent with a bloody object rubbing against the box? Yes, it would. People 439. What are we seeing in People's Exhibit 439 now? People's Exhibit 439 is inside that basement storage room. We can see the concrete floor and we can see Sharpie marks on the floor. So after all of the items had been taken out of the storage room, we did do Blue Star on the basement and then the areas with the presumptive positive reaction were actually circled with Sharpies. And 
Did you photograph the blue star in the basement? So there was an attempt made and we had a bit of a camera malfunction. And when that started happening, that's actually when I decided to go ahead and circle the areas where we had that uh, reaction. Uh, the reaction was observed by four individuals, uh, but that way we could have a visual of the areas that had that presumptive positive blue glow. Uh, 440. What do we see in 440? People's Exhibit 440 is, again, a photograph of the floor of the basement storage room where we can see the circled Sharpie marks. We can actually still see some of the spray from the liquid blue star as well. Uh, but for point of reference, in the upper left corner, uh, we can see kind of the two by four. So that's actually where the, the entry was. So this actually spanned across the storage room to the northeast corner, kind of where a sump pump was located. Could you use the pointer again and just kind of point out where the circles are? Um, I don't know, maybe we can. I need to go over there to turn the lights down on that switch. It's up to you. I, the, uh, it's the green buttons there. Which one? Yeah, both see. of them. That helps. Can you point out the circles now on the. So entry is going to be over here in the upper left, and we can see the furnace back here. So we have areas circled here spanning across the entire photograph all the way over to the lower right corner of the photograph. Now, does that go towards where we saw that clear tub that you collected with the purple handles on January 29, 2020? From, from what I recall, it spanned again to the northeast corner, which is kind of toward the corner for reference where the red suitcase and that large carpet roll was i would have to see another photograph to remember where that tub was on that at that time okay um let's go to 441 then we'll go back to that photograph okay <laughs> what do we see in 441 people's exhibit 441 is actually a photograph to where we're seeing the northeast corner so we can see the sump pump back in the upper right hand corner and we have the same uh, area where we can see the Sharpie circles going into that corner and you can actually still see some of the liquid spray marks around them. We can go back to 407 now, please. And if you could find a reasonable breaking point in the next couple of minutes, please. Yep, we're, we're gonna finish up with this and- I thought that was it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we have 407 up now. There's the red suitcase that you alluded to. Do you see the tub there? Yes. So based on seeing this photograph and the proximity of the tub to that area, uh, yes. So those did go in that general direction. Uh, that sump pump I had mentioned is actually just to the left behind all of those boxes. Those are my questions, John. Thanks. Okay. Um, means, um, I like boss. Uh, no, um, Ms. Bell, I'm going to have you step down and, um, cause I have uh, some things that I need to attend to. So, uh, I'll have you step down. You'll have to come back on Monday. Okay. Okay. All right. So we'll see you back on Monday at nine o'clock. Thank you, your honor. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Do you mind if I go slip those lights? Yes, please. I was going to ask somebody to do that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we will take our um, uh, weekend break. Again, I'm going to go through the, uh, the long instruction uh, that you uh, probably are tired of, but I still need to read it anyway. Um, you've probably already guessed that there's been some public or media interest in this case. There could be more in the coming weeks. You must guard against that as you will be required to decide this case based on the evidence presented and the instructions that I give to you. Again, you can tell your friends and family that uh, you are on this jury and how long you think it will go. You can ask for their help in avoiding exposure to stories or even opinions from others regarding this case. But you cannot otherwise discuss anything about this case with anyone and you should not listen to any opinions regarding this case from someone else. You can still blog or communicate with others, just not about this case. You can't do any blogging about your jury experience or, communica or communication with other jurors. You can still watch TV. You can still go on the internet. You uh, still can patronize uh, Amazon, um, but you just can't do anything about this case. 
If anything regarding this case comes through your feed, change the channel, turn the page, do not give it any attention. You are not allowed to look at, read, consult, or use any material of any kind, including any newspapers, magazines, television, and radio broadcasts, dictionaries, medical, scientific, technical, religious, or law books or materials, or the internet in connection with your jury service. I want to emphasize that you must not seek or receive any information about this case from the internet, which includes all social networking, Google, Wikipedia, blogs, and other websites. You are not allowed to do any research of any kind about uh this case um so i'm going to dismiss uh or i'm going to send all of you almost all of you home uh right now um we have um as you know we're referring to all of the jurors by numbers and you guys are probably going crazy because your numbers keep changing every time you come back you have a different seat number and it's based upon uh where you are when you come back in that group and where you are seated so in this case i'm going to uh, um let everybody leave except for juror number 12, white hoodie, hoop earrings. Um, I need her to stay for just a few minutes. Everybody else is excused. Uh, enjoy your weekend. And juror number 12, if you can remain with us for a moment. All rise for the jury, please. And uh, juror number 10, if you just want to let yourself out. Thank you. You may all be seated. Record should reflect that all of the tourists except for juror number 12 have left the courtroom. Um, if we if we uh, did our work right, I have the right juror. If we didn't, I apologize. Um, I think you probably know why you might be here. Um, are you the juror that communicated to Mr. Combs that you knew one of the witnesses? Okay. Um, you probably feel a little weird with everybody staring at you right now, but you did the right thing. Okay. Um, this happens, okay, it's, not, it's really not that uncommon that somebody says, looks through the witness list and, and goes, I don't know any of these people. Uh, they don't recognize names, names sometimes change, sometimes they just don't remember the name and then they see the face and they remember the person. And they do the right thing. They tell us um, that they know one of the witnesses. So who is it that you know and how is it that you know that person? So I know the expert witness, um, Stephanie Happ. I okay. think it was her last name um, distantly. Okay. How is it that you know her? So about three years ago, um, I was a worship leader at a church. My dad was the pastor. Stephanie's mother-in-law attended that church. Stephanie did not. Um, Stephanie's mother-in-law is getting up in years and wanted to discuss with my father and I as her uh, pastoral staff her wishes for her last, um, for her funeral. And she wanted to do that while she was still alive. So about three years ago, um, this person um, that attended our church gathered my father and mother and I at what turned out to be Stephanie's house um, and along with her other children to discuss her end of life wishes. So for about uh, a couple of hours, we were in that home uh, discussing funeral arrangements, um, and then we all greeted one another warmly, and I left. Okay. Um, then, as it turns out, uh, last October, this same church member of ours had a, an adult daughter who passed away from stomach cancer. Um, because I was part of the clergy of this thing, um, she, Janice, um, asked me to sing at her daughter's funeral. So I did that. And at that funeral, I saw Stephanie, greeted her, gave her a hug, told her I was very sorry for her loss, and we've gone our separate ways. So those are the two times that I have seen and spoken with Stephanie. Okay. So um, I have to ask this question. Did you, and, and I know it's going to sound kind of uh, foolish, but um, did you or did she mention anything about this case uh, to you during either one of those instances? Um, 
do you or would you be able to judge her testimony just as you've been able to judge everybody else's testimony in this case? Absolutely. Is there anything about the contacts that you've had with her that would make you say, you know, I'm going to believe her uh, because I know her or I'm going to disbelieve her because I know her or something along those lines? Yes, sir. Do you think that you can weigh her testimony just as you would weigh the testimony of any other witness in this case? I do. Do you believe that you can still remain fair and impartial? Uh, do, I'm sorry. Do you believe you can still remain a fair and impartial juror in this case, um, even though you've had some contacts with one witness and not others? I do. All right. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you back to the jury room. I want you to wait there for a couple of minutes um, while I talk with the lawyers, and then I will get back to you. Okay. okay. And. Um, what you can tell the jurors, uh, if somebody asks, you can tell them that you had a discussion or we had a discussion here because you disclosed uh, rightly that you recognized one of the witnesses after you saw them, and we had to ask you about that. Um, don't tell them who the witness was that you knew. Don't tell them what our conversation was, anything else like that. But at least this way they'll know what the conversation was, and they will know that the right thing to do in a situation like this is to say, hey, I know one of those witnesses, and let us know. Okay? All right. All rise for Juror 12, please. Thank you. You may all be seated. Record should reflect that juror number 12 has left the courtroom. Are there any challenges to juror number 12 uh, continuing to serve as a juror in this case? Prosecution? Uh, no, Judge. The uh, juror was very conscientious, brought this information to us immediately, it sounds like. Um, talked about two passing interactions that she had with uh, Ms. Hap some years ago and indicates that she can still still be very fair and impartial in this case and is not going to give her any special deference or anything like that. So I don't think there's any reason from our perspective that she would be a challenge for cause. Uh, defense? I'm going to move um, to have her excused for a couple of uh, different reasons. One, I'm not alleging any bad faith or anything on the part of this juror, but it appears that it's more than a passing connection. This would sound, at least what I was gathering, it sounded like she was hoping to do end of life planning um, for mishaps. I thought it was her mother, um, that there was a couple hour long meeting at the house, that there is a connection with a shared church, um, a religious connection. Part of the issue is, Your Honor, this is not just a lay or perceiving witness. This is an expert um, witness whose opinion these, witness, these jurors are going to have to determine um, the basis of their opinion and how they value their opinion and so forth. So it's not just whether she give, would give her more credibility. Um, it's also how that they, she would weigh her expert opinion on this. And it's expert opinion that is key to this case. Um, Ms. Hap has identified the gun in question that she testified about as being the gun that actually killed um, Gannon Stout. Um, furthermore, they're going to have later evidence that is going to put Ms. Stout's DNA on that gun. And so this is uh, the key connection of all the, the other, there's everything else is circ there are a lot of circumstantial. I mean, this is pretty direct tie um, with Ms. Stout to the weapon that this witness is saying um, actually killed um, Gannon Stout. So based upon that, I would say it's a little bit different situation because it's an expert and it's her opinion that she's going to be judging and she does have a relationship with her. Um, further, Your Honor, I can say that that juror was one of the ones that we had a lot of debate on as far as whether or not to use a preemptory challenge on. Um, she came, it was down, she was our last one. It was her and another juror. Whoever we used our last preemptory on it, the choice was between her and that juror, um, had we known that she had this kind of connection with um, this expert witness, we would use a preemptory challenge on her. Um, we're, I think, more than or close to halfway through this trial. Um, we have six alternate jurors on this case. Um, I think that it was a, it's a cleaner um, to excuse her at this time with our thanks and move one of the alternates on, um, and that way we can go forward. All right. Um... I want to think about this uh, over the weekend. I'm also going to uh, review her uh, questionnaire again as well, and also the um, seating and strike chart um, to see where we were uh, or uh, to see how the peremptories um, 
shook out. I don't know since she was not excused whether that will help me a whole lot, but I want to look at two of those things and then I will make a decision before we start trial on Monday. Okay. We'll go from there. Yeah, we just have one other issue to bring up. Go ahead. Uh, are you ready for it now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, it's come to our um, attention. Hold on just Okay. A she can go ahead and go, um, and we'll see her back on that. Okay. Mr. Allen? It's come to our attention that um, during the, I think, mostly the afternoon session of witnesses today, that the defendant has been um, flipping the bird potentially to witnesses or to our family that are here um, for Gannon. And uh, there have been pictures that have uh, been passed to me during the, this process. One, it's disrespectful to this court. It's disrespectful to this, to this process. And I would ask the court to admonish her to uh, refrain from acting this way in the future during the pendency of this case. Okay. Um, I've not seen any of that. But on the other hand, the defendant is uh, to my far right. I do see, I can see her some um, on a screen. But um, I'll just take it as is. <laughs> um, Ms. Stauk, what you need to understand is that I can control the conduct of an awful lot of people in the courtroom, including yours. And um, don't do that. Don't show that kind of, uh, don't be making disrespectful uh, gestures to witnesses, uh, to people, to family members, anything like that. You need to understand um, that if that continues, I can have you removed and the trial will continue without you. And you will sit in a holding cell in this building. And every time we take a break, I'll bring you back up to ask whether or not you can conform your conduct to what I'm requiring. If you choose to act in a uh, disruptive uh, behavior or disruptive fashion, I'll just have you removed and we'll continue on without you. And then we'll check and see if uh, you want to come back and uh, behave in a respectful manner. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, and we will see where we are on Monday. All right. All right, court will be in recess. You can leave everything here. Um, the only thing that I for sure want to have locked up is the gun and the ammunition. I don't ever leave that out. Um, so that we need to make sure gets into a um, locker somewhere or into an evidence closet somewhere. Other than that, we'll see everybody nine o'clock on Monday morning. Thank you. All right.